My name is Eric Smith. And Eric, are we alone? Um, some of us more than others. <laughs> right. So there, for you, I mean, we're alone in this room, right? But uh, when, I, when I ask the question, are we alone, uh, what does the we mean to you? I don't understand what people want from the question okay. in the sense that the biosphere is rich and interconnected and the history of mankind seems to consist of stubbornly trying to create separations that don't actually exist to make ourselves more isolated within a biosphere where we actually aren't as isolated as people keep wanting to be. So I'm not sure I understand what people view themselves as a part of now and what they would consider it better or worse to view themselves as a part of if we knew something new. So I think you just said uh, we can't be alone because uh, we're not alone on Earth. We, in every original culture that I can think of, there's a name that the people have for themselves and there's a name they have for everything else to make themselves maximally distant mm -hmm. from everything else. Um, in South Africa, Namibia, Botswana, you have the Junhuasi, who are one of the southern San groups. And their name for themselves is, you know, the Junhuasi. And then they have this other name, Kon, which is all the wild things. That includes their Bantu farmer neighbors. It includes the Anglo South Africans. And it includes, it includes the four-legged things. And those are all the wild and dangerous things. And they consider the four-legged ones like the leopards a little bit less wild and dangerous than the two-legged things because the key to being people as opposed to everything else is that you can understand their language and they feel they can understand the language of the leopards a little bit mm -hmm. and that makes some sense. So it's very much like the autistics world of others being incomprehensible. Um, to mm -hmm. any of us who grew up in the scientific world that traditional view seems pathological because it seems to build a separation that to us is not natural. We have so much in common. How can you make such a big deal of such small differences? But what we have to realize, I think, from looking at the history of the human world is that the human habit is to create these separations. And that's part of the cognitive fabric that we're going to have to work within. Isn't that isolation couldn't that isolation be seen as a result of the unit of selection being an individual or the unit of selection being the tribe which has identified itself as the people? If, if the unit of selection was sure only a larger group, I don't know, the biosphere, then we would be asking the question, are we alone by meaning, are we the biosphere alone in the universe? I think it's more particular to the cognition of social animals. Um, at, in some sense, yes, Darwinian dynamics is a mechanism that's present in anything. But you have to ask, does that fact tell you anything about the particularity of the phenomenon you're asking about? And for this one, I, my guess would be no. My guess would be that this is something about social cognition. But if you, the reason I say this is I had to give a talk at a museum where some wonderful kids in northern New Mexico had put together just a fantastic exhibit on origin of life. And I was talking to the public who had supported them and their parents and their teachers and the other things. And I was trying to explain how our whole habit of scientific understanding of biology has been walking backward into the truth which comes up behind us and which we never see until it's long past us. So Within the human world, we separate ourselves from other people. Within the living world, we separate ourselves from other animals. Then the whole notion of the organic compounds traditionally was those were the things that were only created by life. They were not part of abiotic chemistry until Justus von Liebig and Friedrich Wöhler actually succeeded in making a couple of them, at which point that wall was kind of broken. But then, when was that, 1870 or something? There was still another 80 years until the 1950s and the Miller-Urey synthesis, during which we thought that the bulk of the carbon-carbon compounds could not be synthesized in an unsupervised system. 
And so we've just had to be beaten back at every turn from putting in these separations. So a lot of my, what, evangelizing, if you could call it that, for a point of view on the situation of the biosphere, is to try to say a lot of the biosphere is an encapsulation of planetary processes and a continuation of them. Some of it is innovative, some of it is a point of departure. But to try to look at each of the components and see a point of departure in them is mm -hmm. probably not to understand the system correctly. The point of departure is of a different kind. It happens at a system level. But a lot of what is, let me, let me amend this too. It's not only that incidentally life retains things from the pre-living planet and then what's living is the innovative part, a lot of what is fundamental to being alive is exactly the part that has, has been preserved of the planetary substrate and of the organic chemical sub-processes. So we don't want to look for the essence of life only in what's different, even if we can identify life by some of the innovations. It is as much in the essence of life to have kept some of these things as it is to have invented others or to have pruned some of the other planetary regularities away. Okay, now it sounds to me like uh, it reminds me of you, of people in general trying to make the word we bigger. We being the people in this group, or we Caucasians, or we our race, or we people, we animals, we life forms, and now we biosphere. And let's forget about all those divisions uh, for a second, and let's ask the question then, are we alone, where we means, are we the biosphere on Earth, the only biosphere in the universe? Now that's a well-posed question. However, we want to be careful of a habit of thought that, again, I think is not right, and that's the habit of putting dichotomies in things. Because there's an obvious unity among living things, there's a tendency to try to say, there's a tendency to try to use life as a predicate of objects, to say, let's begin with a view of the world as a collection of objects, and then make two sets, and we'll sort the living ones and the non-living ones. Mm -hmm. And I think that doesn't work. I think the unity of life actually comes from the participation of its components in the emergence and dynamics and persistence of the biosphere. But it's not a predicate and it's not a property of the components. It's more a matter of their situation as part of an ongoing process. And what that means, if you think about the biosphere that way, you can say, okay, life is not one thing, it's a kind of unity and confederacy, meaning that there are lots of things that were not, are not the same as each other and that were once not dependent on each other. And they have, through a sequence of transformations, they've been brought into interdependence on each other to such a degree that the independent forms are no longer possible on the planet. And the only forms of them we know are the forms that depend on each other to exist and to persist. And in that sense, yes, they're a unity. But the differentness of their origin and the differentness of their character is often still visible. And I think the right interpretation of that is that life is not one thing. It is a unification of many things that are inherently different and in their origins are different. And the origin of life was not a transition, and there was not one special transition mm -hmm. that distinguished the living side from the non-living side. There was a whole sequence of transitions of qualitatively different kind. The biosphere we have now is the outcome of all of them. So then if you say, what exists on other planets? My counter question is, how much of what's in the biosphere are you looking for? Are you looking for the beginnings of selection in organic geochemistry that will turn out to be the same selection that's in life, but that on some other planet stopped part way and then didn't get followed by a bunch of other stages? Are you looking for the beginning of selected macromolecular complexity, but maybe not cellular encapsulation? Would you be happy with something in which the core of some of the amino acids was the same, but the ramification to later amino acids didn't happen or happened in a different way. If you got all the way to cells, I think everyone would say, okay, that qualifies as a biosphere as well as the early Archean did and we're all happy. How many other stages are there though 
where planetary organization could have stopped short of something that we would have an easy time classifying, but that actually was an essential stepping stone to the biosphere we know. And that, I think, becomes an interesting question because we start to break down. We don't use these big category terms from the informal language. We ask crisp questions about specific things. Okay, in your mind, there is this cascade of phase transitions that led to what we now call traditionally life on Earth. And uh, let's just accept that and say, okay, that's the way it is and that's the way it was. And let's say that, oh, that's probably the way it will be elsewhere on other Earth-like wet, rocky planets. And as you point out, well, then we can be more specific and ask the question, well, let's say there are, I don't know, for our sake of argument, 10 stepping stones or 20, it doesn't matter how many there are, but there's a, some kind of progression that we can identify in our own origin. And then ask, okay, uh, there must be some way to prioritize the probabilities of going from a completely abiotic, young, wet, rocky planet to, okay, first cascade, I mean, first phase transition. Second, oh, that's pretty likely. Second one, oh, that's kind of unlikely. Third, oh, that's more likely once you get to second. In other words, is there any way to prioritize this? Because that, I guess, is the question that I'm asking when I say, are we alone? As you probably point out, well, what's we? And there are all these phase transitions. So what fraction of these phase transitions and to what extent can, let's put, let's imagine a probability distribution of other Earths that have gone one, one cascade down, two cascades down, seven, and then make a probability distribution. And where are we compared to those others? Or is there some in which there are no phase transitions and are completely not even at step one? Right, right. It's, that's a great question because it is so particular. When Steve Gould wanted to talk about the role of chance and necessity in evolutionary dynamics, he didn't want to stay with the word chance, and he didn't want to inherit a word like frozen accident from Francis Crick. He very particularly was interested in historical contingency. The idea that things may, at the time they occur, be more or less necessary, but that what occurs may be so particularly dependent on boundary conditions that modest changes in the boundary conditions would lead you somewhere that's significantly different from the boundary conditions that happened to be there at that time and place. Mm -hmm. For the answer to your question, I think contingency is the right way to frame it. For phase transitions that are local and that involve a fit or a rearrangement of small components, like finding a mineral phase, getting frost on the windshield in the morning or something like that, those tend to not have very many solutions and they tend to form rapidly and robustly. But as you start to get higher into an, a hierarchy of architectural complexities, the building blocks at the low level assemble into bigger and bigger pieces. And for them to go on to find more ways to assemble into bigger pieces, I think we can say that that process becomes more fragile and that it starts to get more solutions which are more dependent on details of boundary condition as you go up in the hierarchy. So for instance, ideal gases have one solution. Perfect fluids have one solution. Superconductors have one, or not superconductors, perfect conductors have one solution as you go toward absolute zero. But you get up even into the world of mineralogy where you'd think, okay, how complicated can it be? We have the discrete rotation groups of the orbitals of elements, and then we have the problem of forming a regular lattice to fill space. But there, all of a sudden, you have integer arithmetic. And so now you have tens of thousands of solutions depending on exactly what elements and what ratios you're dealing with. And I'm just talking about simple minerals. This is not even rocks. And you take any significant pressure, temperature, and composition phase diagram, and it looks like a stained glass window with a sensitivity it's depend of its depending on boundary conditions. So this says that to answer your question about which things we expect to find and how often we expect to find them, we're going to have to be a lot more precise about planetary condition formation and planetary maturation trajectories. And this is an area where you can see the exoplanet split quite strongly. Most people in the exoplanet community, I would say at this stage, are splitters in the sense that there was a prejudice going in that a lot of planetary systems were going to look like the solar system and a lot of planets were going to look like Earth. And when they started to look, even when you take into account the observation biases, they find that most planetary systems are just not at all like solar systems, and most planets are not at all like Earth. And so they're kind of rebelling against this 
geocentric habit that people had, and they probably are emphasizing how much of the state space is occupied that we didn't even know existed. They might emphasize it even more strongly than they believe it because they're pushing back against a wrong prejudice, but there still are some lumpers in the exoplanet community who say, look, the parameter space is not so uniformly occupied, but whereas you have a Hertzsprung-Russell diagram for stars where you can take all the processes that go in stars and you can put them on a really simple two-dimensional plot, and the set of actual stars is a set of relatively narrow bands in that two-dimensional plot, you suggest a Hertzsprung-Russell diagram for planets to an exoplanet person, you will not be invited back to almost any group. So if we take seriously the notion of contingencies, this is a place where we can really engage the exoplanet community and say, how much do you know? How can we help you look for what questions will be most fertile? And are there clues in the biosphere today about which divisions or which, which boundary conditions were most important to the ongoing trajectory? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm, I'm a little bit of a lumper myself, so I see that the sun is so much like, is very representative of the entire universe in, in terms of its uh, relative abundances of elements. And, there, and the devolatilization, which leads to a rocky planet, I think are, are pretty universal. So I expect a lots and lots and lots of what would be at least roughly called Earth-like planets out there with water. And if that's the case, then we can start to analyze the question of which of these cascades, for example, some of them have 20% more magnesium or 10% less uh, calcium, the, the stars do. And so we can just assume that those are you know, 5% more or less aluminum or 20%. Anyway, the, the variations of these elements in, in the rocky planets that I suspect that are out there are 10, 20, 30% at about the two, one or two sigma level. So if we have that type of variation in rocky planets, and, these chem and so the chemistry of the mineralogy will change by 10, 20, 30 percent like that, uh, would, would that affect the cascades that you're talking about that led to life on Earth? How would that affect? What's the biggest influence on them? Mm. What's the, well, let's talk, yeah. If you're talking about cascades, let's talk about the, the, can we talk about one, two, and three cascade out of the 10 or 20? What are the most important first ones? And no, you can't order them? Surely there must be some order to them. Contingency has an order. You know, first you get uh, nationalism, then you get Hitler or something. I don't know. <laughs> you, you can guess and you can spin narratives until the cows come home. And much of origin of life theorizing consists of that. Um, well, Gould a, talked about adaptive fairy tales, for example, and some of them are very believable. It's a great thing to do because that's where human imagination comes in. Which but is not to be snuffed at, not to be... Not, no, 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 that's, that's the beginning of everything. But, you know, like dreams and visions, they can be the source of all we have, but you don't want to believe almost any of them until they've been through some pretty rigorous filtering. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you don't want to believe any of them. So in your brain, what, have you put any of these cascades through a filtering in which you can assign oh. a probability or a, to them? I, no. No. So I'm not an expert in the planetary science side. And one of the great things about being at ELSI is that most of my colleagues are actually planetary scientists, which means that they're mineralogists, they're petrologists, they're you know, planet formation people. And the complexity of mineralogy and petrology is overwhelming to a mere physicist. And when you look at the number of things on which surface conditions on a planet depend, you realize that a lot of things could matter and they can vary widely. So I can give you a list of the set of things that can matter and can vary widely. The Earth is mostly dry and not entirely. You can break, let, go ahead and break in if you don't want this to go this no, way. No, 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 well, I, I, was wondering, I was wondering if, is there a useful distinction to be made between deterministic sciences like chemistry and physics versus historical sciences like history and biology? In other words, they, biology and history, it's one damn thing after another in which there's a memory to the system. And in physics, the things with memory are, I guess, a much more restricted set than we're used to studying. I think that's an artifact of humans. 
I think people have solved the easy problems first and now they're stuck on the harder problems. <laughs> so physics too contains a, uh, a lot of things that whose, 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 I guess, the way it progresses, the way it evolves, depends on what it, how it was in the past. If we had more imagination as physicists, a lot of the stuff we're stuck on in biology would be called unsolved problems in physics. Mm -hmm. Physics has not cast its net widely enough or been brave enough mm -hmm. to take that on. And that is not to say that when they are solved, biology will look like physics used to look, which is what makes the biologists mad. Mm -hmm. It is rather to say that the emergence of memory and enough choices that they're capable of carrying memory mm -hmm. isn't the end of lawfulness. It's a new thing that works within a frame of lawfulness. And it makes understanding lawfulness more difficult and more complicated. And that is a domain of physics that we almost haven't gone into. And biology should be leading us there and should be forcing us to learn a whole lot of concepts from a new cloth that we never learned before. But before we leave the, the topic of what can matter, mm -hmm. let me give you a brief idea of the kinds of things that people here worry about a lot. The Earth is mostly dry which is a kind of a delicate balance, as far as we know, of infall, of how fast a magma ocean phase of a planet quenches and how much of the volatile inventory it keeps in the planet, which can then later be outgassed. If it outgasses too early while the planet's hot, it all escapes and you're gone. If the infall happens too early and it's lost again, then you're gone. So to have a planet that has this much rock and this much water, or whatever the, the right exact geometry is for the Earth, might be in a transition between the two things that are common, which is nearly total desiccation versus drowning so that you have no subaerial rock exposed. So that's one. Another one, amazingly, that we don't understand. Which planets are tectonic? What are the styles of magmatism and tectonism, and how is it organized, and when does it start? Turns out that has major consequences because it determines the rate at which the mantle can cool. And the rate at which the mantle cools determines the amount of disequilibrium in the core. And the amount of disequilibrium in the core determines whether you have a geodynamo. And the geodynamo determines whether or not you have protection from particle bombardment from the stellar wind. Mm -hmm. And that can determine then how much of your atmosphere you keep. The interesting thing about particle bombardment is that, you know, like rain that falls on the heads of the just and the unjust alike, particle bombardment knocks atoms out of the atmosphere, no matter what they are. Very different from photolysis and genes escape, which will give you a hydrogen escape, leaving your oxidants and heavier stuff behind. Genes escape is a soft process that will give you a big redox disequilibrium between the upper atmosphere and the largely reducing iron magnesium silicates in the interior, which are probably a, a generic baseline mineral composition in most places. That redox disequilibrium is hugely significant for biotic communities on Earth, and there are people like me who think that it's always been hugely significant and was important at the very origin of life. Well, let me stop you there. How generic is such a battery on other, let's say, Earth-like planets that have similar mineralogy and a star that's similar to the sun? I don't know. And the reason I don't know is that that long list of feedbacks that I just gave you Everything in that list could affect everything else in the list. The amount of water can affect rock strength and the, pres the rheology and the preservation of weak seams. Yeah. So it can affect tectonics. And yeah, but everything can affect everything else. It's not only complicated, but some of those complications are universal complications where you expect them to be everywhere. Yes, but the, the parameter space is now starting to get big. Yes. Because we have hydration, we have mineralogy, we have rate of quenching, which can have to do with composition, rate of infall, proximity to the star, and what the rest of the stellar disk mm -hmm. is doing as the mm -hmm. planetary system forms. Now, it's not a vast parameter space compared to the number of stars, but it's a big enough parameter space that simulating it Well, the is number now, of stars is probably infinite. The well, the num <laughs> yeah, the number of stars that we can reasonably talk about and start to make inferences about observationally. Um, but 10 to the 22 in the observable universe. Yeah. We're not talking about a parameter space that's, that, that's so big that 10 to the 22 stars in their planetary systems can't sample it. But we're, we are talking about a parameter space that's big enough that people who simulate planetary system formation, I think it's fair to say, 
they do not have an accurate understanding how much of the phenomenology they don't even know about yet. And none of that is tightly coupled to what the late stage outcome is for the trajectory of a planet for things like atmosphere subsurface dynamics. So I'll give you where this comes down to application. There was a good National Academies conference in Irvine, California a month or two ago, something like that. Jim Casting was one of the organizers. And there are many people in, excited about the oceans of Enceladus because it seems very likely that there is a serpentinization process that is reducing and um, whatever you call deacidifying, alkalinizing the oceans of Enceladus through rock water interactions that are much like the ones that are going on with mantle rocks on the Earth. The question is, is that significant for the origin of life? On Earth, serpentinization is hugely important because you have this atmosphere that's persistently driven to an oxidizing disequilibrium with the subsurface. And so when you're continually delivering electrons at the subsurface and then having oxygen there to accept them in the oceans and atmosphere, you have a tremendous redox battery. You have a volt that's available to you on a planetary scale. And if you have spreading centers and mid-ocean ridges, then that electron flux is delivered in organized systems where new crust is forming. Now, if you have local magnetism or something like that, you can have reduced metals being delivered to the surface in other ways, but that's a little bit different. That's episodic as opposed to being steady and organized. But the, but the redox gradient, if, if it is supposed to be helpful in forming life, has to be on a very small scale, not kilometers, but probably, I don't know, uh, millimeters or something. Atomic scale. But Atomic. that's what the rock water alteration zones at spreading centers give you mm -hmm. on a tectonic planet with an oxidizing atmosphere and comparatively oxidizing oceans. That sounds like a universal statement you just made, a more universal than the complications you were going through earlier. It's the kind of, it's the kind of environment dependence that empirically we can say is overwhelmingly important for the anaerobic biosphere on Earth today. And also not overwhelmingly rare. On Earth, it is a generic feature. But on Enceladus, where are the electron acceptors? Because you don't have genes escape of hydrogen on Enceladus. Where you have escape, now it may happen on Enceladus. There's a fascinating thing that happens. You have particle bombardment due to the planet's magnetic field. And this can give you peroxides at the top of the ice layer. So you can actually have hydrogen escape with peroxides keeping your oxidant. And in a fascinating way, you can have the ice layer on Enceladus behaving the way the crust does on Earth, creating a redox barrier between an oxidizing peroxide exterior mm. and then a strongly reducing interior. So it's not clear that Enceladus is off the table, but if you were looking for a redox battery on Enceladus- so Off the table for what? For the kind of redox potential that on Earth seems most promising to drive organic complexity. Now, when you say organic complexity, do you, what fraction of the stepping stones or cascades are we talking about? Is that all of them? We don't know. There are two issues. One is how do you form large organic molecules, and the other is how do you select them? Because complexity is both. It's both existence and also pruning. There's a paper, probably more than one, by George Cooper looking at the organic materials in carbonaceous meteorites. And somebody, I don't think this is his estimate, I think he got it from the literature, and I'm sorry I don't have the citation to hand, but there's, there are mass spectrometry estimates that 50,000 is a conservative estimate for the number of distinct small volatiles in carbonaceous meteorite carbon. 500,000 is probably a better estimate, and if you take into account isomers, it's probably many-fold more than that. Compare that to the biosphere where everything goes through a bottleneck of 125 small compounds. So to understand where biotic complexity came from, we have to say if carbonaceous meteorites are in any sense a null model for early organic geochemistry on wet, rocky planets, where does the pruning take place that takes us from that big inventory which is still much smaller than the set of possible compounds. These are just the ones we see. From that big inventory down to the pruning of biochemistry. How much of it was Darwinian in a cellular age? 
how much of it was a still effectively Darwinian-like, but maybe without fully formed cells, how much of it was a geochemical process, but one that we don't see reported in asteroids, and why is it not reported in asteroids? What would make a big planet like the Earth different from the parent bodies of the asteroids we have experience with that would allow some of that pruning to take place? And does any big, wet, rocky, vaguely Earth-sized planet have the same things going on or similar things? Not going? obviously so. Not obviously so. So <laughs> you're, we got off on that tangent to address the question, redox disequilibrium necessary for what on Enceladus? Mm. Carbon addition reactions relevant to biochemistry seem to all be endergonic in one form or another. Endergonic? Endergonic, okay. yes. The reason biological molecules are stable is that after a carbon addition reaction has been performed, a reduction reaction comes in and pulls off an oxygen somewhere and increases the stability of the molecule. So we have a problem of energy coupling or energy storage. What on the, an early planet relevant to the Earth is responsible for enabling those endergonic carbon additions? And are those processes active on some significantly differently structured body like Enceladus? One of the possibilities is that the electrochemical gradient carried by soluble small molecules is enabling those endergonic carbon addition reactions or forcing them. Another possibility is that you have a direct electrochemical potential. Now, on Earth, we have both of those things available because where you have metal center leaching, you have reduced soluble compounds that come into alteration fluids, and where you have precipitate formation, you can have a direct electrochemical potential, you know, a half a volt, 700 millivolts, something like that. And both of these are considered to be eligible to drive carbon addition reactions. If the thing that is performing the role of the redox barrier on Enceladus is an ice sheet rather than a crust as it is on Earth, are there just geophysical environments that would have the same effect on creating soluble redox carriers or electrochemical potentials in that environment? So each of these questions, when you try to break it down to the level of mechanism, mm -hmm. turns out to involve elements of chemistry, elements of whole planetary system mm -hmm. energetics, but then also elements of local geometry and simple physical phases. Mm -hmm. And the interesting and hard question is, for how much of that does the particularity matter? It mm -hmm. can be robust and driven in some context, but if the context is very rare, then you may have to look at quite a few planets before you're in the right domain of the parameter space. When I ask mm -hmm. most people the question, are we alone, they, something like 80% of people say, no, we're not alone. And I say, why do you think that? You know, you don't know anything about the origin of life. Why do you think that? And they say, numbers. And I say, what do you mean by numbers? And I was like, well, they're just so, the universe is so big, filled with so many stars and probably Earth-like planets, that therefore there must be life elsewhere. What do you think of that argument? I don't know what to make of it. Um, Try a little harder. <laughs> in, no, I genuinely don't. In exponential functions, the difference between things that are almost sure to happen and things that you'll never see mm -hmm. is not a big difference. That's well, why chemistry is such a great substrate for life, because you can change a barrier energy by factors of two to five, and you can make a difference between things that will happen spontaneously in water and molecules that can be stable for 10,000 years. So anything that involves exponential combinatorics, you can become unable to sample the state space really fast. So for instance, th this is the reason we had what I think people would agree is a misunderstanding of the role of genome sequences early on. The number of possible sequences and the number of possible genomes and the number of possible proteins you can synthesize from genomes of the length that can now be maintained mm. is so large that all the cells in all the organisms on all the world, you feel like you're in Casablanca, can't sample them, right? Of all the cells in all the organisms in all the world, you know, we have to be. Oh, that's, is that, that's a, <laughs> Comfrey Bogart said that yeah, to the end. Exactly. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So if you want to make an argument that big numbers are sure to save you, you have to give me a null model against what parameter space you're trying to sample. Yeah. And you 
you know, you're fair when you say, what do I think of that? And I say, I don't know what to make of it. And you say, try harder. <laughs> that's, a, that's a fair rejoinder. But on the other hand, it's a virtue to not have opinions about what you just don't know at all. So you're saying that you don't know how far along in the exponential you are when you're talking about these cascades? Not Is at that, all. That's not what you say. Uh, no, I'm, I agree with you 100%. That's exactly what I mean. I do not know at all. But you give the impression that these cascades, at least in the case of Earth, were somehow inevitable. It's, it's like lightning or something, that it has to happen once you have the free energy building up. Or is that just the first cascade? That's a quasi-empirical guess on my part. Um, the things that we see in the macro world are robust things. Um, this is a kind of a central limit theorem. Are you a robust thing, Eric Smith? I'm, I'm going to ask you a question. It, it, we cosmologists uh, look like, because we look at the observable universe and it looks flat, it's a good assumption that the universe may be spatially infinite. If that's the case, there could be an infinite number of stars, an infinite number of Earths. Right. And therefore, you can ask the question, well, it's often then stated, anything with a finite probability will happen an infinite number of times. And epsilon times infinity equals infinity. That's the little mathematics that is done. So do you think that there are an infinite number of Eric Smiths in the universe, the entire universe? Or do you assign a set of measures zero to your existence? In which case, the argument that I just gave doesn't work. Right. I never, because I'm not a Cantor type person. <laughs> I, I don't like infinities and get them out of here. No, no, no. I never, do, I never do work where infinity is a formal quantity. I do work in finite systems, and then I look at the order in which limits are taken so. to try to figure out what it is I mean to say. So it's not that there is not a formal calculus of infinities for some questions, but in my case, if I haven't started with finite things and been specific about the order in which limits are taken, I don't claim I understand what I'm asserting. So it's a kind of a mental hygiene. So you don't have to do any renormalization in your chemistry. You're only at the, at a, on a tail of a, a distribution and you're not going to go to the limit. You're just going to approach that limit and stay in finite mathematics. Well, now there are a lot of places where you could do something formal and say, oh, there's no question to be solved here. Or you could do something practical and realize there are very interesting questions. <laughs> well, how about English? English is a wonderful thing. We're using it right now. And you can ask the question. In Hollywood, right. a lot of aliens are speaking English. And they have, in other words, English has evolved elsewhere. Now, you could say, OK, let's play with this idea. Should we expect that to happen or not? And most people would say, are you kidding? That's crazy. English right. is such a con contrived, right. quirky thing. The probability of it is, is I don't know, zero, or you would say, no, it's at the very far end of a distribution. It's really, really small. Right. But there's an important difference between zero and really small, particularly when you start playing with infinities. And, and you know, I think you might want to take it seriously that the universe could be infinite, and therefore there's, we are dealing with an infinite number of Earth-like planets. If you want to sample parameter space, that's a good way to do it. Yeah, except for the fact that there's what the universe samples and there's what you sample. Let me give you an example of where I think practical people get something done. Um, <laughs> As opposed to you, Charlie. <laughs> no, 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 no. Where if you started at the formal end, there are things that you wouldn't try to do. But if you start at the practical end, there's a lot you can do. So in evolutionary reconstruction, one of the things that I spend some time doing is trying to understand evolutionary reconstruction of human language patterns. Um, there's a kind of a purist idea that everything is subject to laws, but the laws have an infinite collection of contingencies, most of which have been rubbed out by history. So everything is completely regular, and there's no role for dice in this, but you don't know any of it. And so therefore, people form incredibly strong opinions. And the only way a scientist can figure out which things they actually don't know is to find out, is to get two of them in a room please do not circulate this among your students um, <laughs> because I'll, I'll be assassinated, um, is to get people in the room, both of whom are absolutely sure they're right and who disagree with each other. That's the only way you can figure out which things they actually don't know. But as a practical person, you can say... It's called hot tubbing in the legal field. <laughs> very good. Go um, as a practical person? As a practical person, there's the issue of sample strength. 
when the complexity or the information required to describe a rule is bigger than the statistical power you have to determine whether it really is a rule or not, you can say treat it as random and make a good model of the randomness because you're not justified in fitting to a rule on the statistical power that you have. And so in looking at what is or is not likely in the universe, is an exact copy of me likely? I don't have, not there's like no- What is the prob- can you assign a probability yeah, to it? That, that entirely depends on defining what sample space you're talking about. The same with life then. When you ask this question, what's the probability of life elsewhere? It depends entirely on the sample space you're talking about. And so the question is, how, what fraction of that sample space is more universal than we should expect elsewhere versus all quirky, contingent, and historical? Right. But most of that, if so much of that question depends on arbitrary choices you make about which sample space you want to talk about, and an infinite collection of other people are free to make an infinite collection of other arbitrary choices. Well, is life an arbitrary thing then? No, but let me, let me finish the sentence. Okay. In that case, it's like John Paulos's criticism of Eddington, where Eddington, in some famous speech, said the universe contains, and then he gave some nine-digit number of stars. And Paulos, in his wonderful book, Enumeris, he says, it's unlikely this tells us a lot about the universe, but it tells us a great deal about Eddington. I don't, why, why, why? I'm an astronomer. I would identify with Eddington. What's, what's, why does Eddington, it not tell Eddington, us a lot about the universe to know how many stars are in it? Eddington was making a statement that so far exceeded the empirical basis he had for giving any number in its precision that the precision was all about Eddington's prejudices. Wait, how many significant digits did he use here? I don't know. <laughs> Wait, go, go ahead and look in Paulos's book because okay. it was a number that was both wildly wrong mm. and given down to a, okay. a single digit or some number oh, like that. Oh, oh. Right. So, you know, I, it was, a, it was a, nine, a nine digit that. number with all the digits filled in <laughs> no, or something no, no, no. like that. Right. He was just doing that for popular so, consumption. Paulos is not shooting fish in a barrel. Okay. He's saying mm. there are intellectual styles that are unproductive, mm. and this is a nice example of one of them. Mm. So, if I look at the small metabolites on Earth, mm. I can say within samples where I have some statistical power, they don't all behave the same way. So let's just look within the amino acids. I can semi-arbitrarily, but not too arbitrarily, cut the amino acids into three groups. And exactly where I want to draw the boundaries of those groups, I have some freedom in, but it's pretty easy for 10 other people working on the same problem for 10 years to decide, let's cut the amino acids into three groups and put the boundaries more or less in the same place as I would. But wait, let me stop you. Why is this discussion relevant to answering the question, are we alone? In your mind, do you have in your cascades that could have happened on other planets, do you have amino acids probably involved? Well, because this says that the three groups of the amino acids are not the same with respect to their probability, but that's a probability about which I can say something mm -hmm. based on the sample within the biosphere we have. And you can't say something about the likelihood of amino acids being involved in life elsewhere? Well. Water? No, you can. No, no, no. A lot of people do. Carbon? I think you're, you're queuing on a piece of this which is not the discussion where I'm trying to say something that I can say. Okay. What I can say is that for the 12 or 13 simple amino acids, they're so heavily anchored in the context of CHO chemistry and core metabolism that they look like the sort of thing that is as deterministic as the whole network in which they're embedded. They're all formed by redundant use of a few small, simple reactions from this network with minimal embellishment. They don't look like something in which there's a lot of choice in the sense that if that CHO network, the citric acid cycle and its environs, are present, it would be hard to escape these and it would never be hard to form them. If you compare that to the periphery of the complex amino acids, which look almost, in many cases, more like cofactors in amino acid form, they come from now at least two different regions in the small molecule CHO network, which means that two things had to independently form, independently be stabilized, and then be brought into interaction. Mm. I'm willing to say, in some hierarchy of likelihood, 
That is a more complex thing that is not more likely than the simple elaborations of only one subnetwork. If I look at their role in biochemistry, they're more marginal, they're used less often. They look like they are incorporated into things like the genetic code later. So I can get several different signatures that I associate with the typical behavior of probable things and improbable things. Mm -hmm. And I can say within the biosphere, if I had to go look for things on other planets and I had to pay a lot of money to build a detector, mm -hmm. what would I look for? Mm -hmm. I would look very early for glutamic acid and glutamine, aspartic acid and asparagine, glycine, alanine, things like that. I would not be so quick to build a detector to look for tryptophan or histidine. How about a detector according to what Lovelock would propose, or Lederberg, for example, in a, I'm looking for chemical disequilibrium in the atmosphere. That turns out to be interesting and harder than people thought it would be. Mm -hmm. Yes. It seems still like a great idea. Mm -hmm. The trick is two things. Let me, let me speak carefully. You can say that disequilibrium is a property of state and not necessarily a property of process. But whether something is in disequilibrium... But can you be more specific? I, I'm, that was a little bit too abstract for me. Say that in other words? Yeah. So people thought it was going to be an easy thing to go out and look for planets in disequilibrium. Atmospheres and chemical disequilibrium. Yes. Okay. Yes. And then they started to do it, and they ran into a whole bunch of confounds where they could say, well, when is it in dis disequilibrium and what's the null model for an informative disequilibrium? Mm -hmm. Which disequilibria are planetary and abiotic? Which disequilibria are distinctively biotic? Right. And I think the state of that discussion is we cannot say anything that we can commit to. Well, Chrisanne and Trotton and Catling has looked at this a little bit in a recent yes. paper and they've yes. talked, uh, interesting, they're making an interesting distinction for me between kinetic disequilibrium and thermodynamic. And they, they had to do thermodynamic disequilibrium calculations, which they kind of admitted, well, that's not really as relevant as it should be, but it's easier to do, I yes. think, was their comment. So I, I think that's exactly right. That's exactly the right point of view. Yes. So can't we make, I mean, but other people are trying with kinetics, but to, know, to do the kinetics, you need to know some more of the details about yep. what atmosphere is. Well, and that's, that's where we should be going. And we should expect that to turn out to be a hard problem. Yes. Yes. What do you think are the major factors which would determine what, I mean, there are kin these kinetic pathways that would, might lead to life. Mm -hmm. There must be some major factors which determine whether you go through this branch or this branch. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah. And for example, for, as a planetary scientist, we say, well, you know what the most important thing is the C to O ratio, because if the C to O ratio is less than one, then you're gonna get a silicate planet. If it's greater than one or 0.8 or something, then you're going to get a carbide planet. It's completely different to condensation sequences going on there. So you get to come to a dichotomy there in the condensation. So this is already very much prebiotic, yeah, but it's a, a, it's a dichotomy that's created by the chemistry. Yeah. So there must be other ones that, I think you yeah. specialize in thinking about the other ones that happen yeah. on this way towards life if, if, in fact, we're going towards life. Right, right. So can you give me some, I'm, what I'm looking for are some, you keep coming up out back to me with lots of complications, mm -hmm. and I'm saying, wait a minute, right. there must be some universals in this that I can say, I'm pretty confident that this will happen on other planets as well as the Earth. That's what I like, for example, water. Is, if we're gonna talk about a biosphere elsewhere, is it gonna be, water is gonna be the solvent? Carbon, is it gonna be the scaffolding? Things like more universal than you know amino acid choices. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, in other words, I, let me ask the question in a different way. Are the cascades that you're imagining that led to life here, is water a universal some part of it, or can you have these cascades without it, or based on another solvent? Same question about uh, uh, same question about uh, carbon. Depends on what you're looking for. Th this is a problem. The nature of my objections is not a council of despair. It's more like a continual lesson in just how incredibly hard it is to speak precisely and to, to know what it is you're asking or what it is you're claiming. We have struggled so hard to get big carbon molecules in an aqueous environment, and life is made of big carbon molecules. 
that a lot of people have made entire careers of trying to get big carbon molecules. Well, you can get a lot of things that are very complicated once you get selection working for you. But here we're on yeah, the boundary between selection and non-selection. But let's stay for right now just in the domain of a particular question in organic chemistry. In formamide, you can make a lot more big carbon molecules than you can in water. And so if your focus goes too strongly on getting big carbon molecules, then you can be very enthusiastic for formamide oceans as a solvent. You can say, oh, origin of life, biosphere, formamide not if you, oceans. Not if, you, not if you have any notion about what the most common liquids in the universe are. That's another issue. No, that's, but a, there's, that's a preceding issue but which, which trumps the this discussion of about, you know, let's do life in the lab. But there's another place where you could argue that the question has broken down even before the validation has broken down. Because if you view the difficulty of big carbon molecules in water as a bug, then, and, and you fixate on big carbon molecules, then you look for some place where you can fix that bug of getting big carbon molecules. If instead, it's precisely the fact that big carbon molecules are so out of equilibrium in a hydrolyzing fluid that enables them to do what they do and to only stay around when they're continuously being replenished, then your emphasis is on the degree of disequilibrium that you're looking for. And then you would never look for some place where you get a lot of big carbon molecules because they're closer to equilibrium because you would say exactly when they become closer to equilibrium, they become irrelevant to the main question we are asking. So the question of what solvent you want and what counts as a biosphere, what doesn't count as a biosphere, we want to speak explicitly, what are you after? Are you after big structures? Are you after selected structures? Are you after structures that can only exist in a disequilibrium environment? Are you... Uh, are, I'm going to get tangled up before I can remember where I wanted to go. Are you only interested in structures that can exist in a disequilibrium environment? And then what are the conditions that make that degree of disequilibrium possible? So I'll give you a classic case where this plays out in a big way. People who want to look for early formation of big molecules on Earth like hydration dehydration cycles or hot cold cycles. This is a form of disequilibrium that I call chasing equilibrium. So you drive the system dry and you say, okay, in a dry system, polymerization will be the equilibrium. And then we'll wet it and we won't allow things to completely hydrolyze and then we'll dry it again. And so we'll try to make a ratchet by chasing equilibrium. Mm -hmm. Okay, you can do that. And it's a lot easier to do in the lab than other things. Mm -hmm. You can say, okay, is this what happens in biology? Well, as far as I know, no. In biology, polymerization is done by cascades of energetic group transfer reactions. And that's how you dehydrate while in the water solution in disequilibrium. Mm -hmm. So primary question number one, is the chasing equilibrium approach to disequilibrium even the right notion of disequilibrium to look for? Or was group transfer cascading the important form of equilibrium all the way back to mm -hmm. when? Mm -hmm. To the Hadean? If you had a chasing equilibrium source of big organic molecules early, but then biochemistry came to depend entirely on a group transfer cascade mm -hmm. for disequilibrium, when did that change take place? And why would it take place? It's very difficult to build a house by assembling the roof and then very quick hurrying to build mm -hmm. walls beneath it before they fall down. Mm -hmm. If your whole bootstrapping to get to large molecules depended on chasing equilibrium, then what kind of a system is it that builds itself entirely a new dependence on group transfers and takes itself entirely away from chasing equilibrium? I'm not saying that chasing equilibrium is wrong, but I'm saying that looking for a paradigm of disequilibrium that is so completely unlike the paradigm used in life gives you a huge glaring question why are these two relevant to each other? Why is one informative about the other? And that question doesn't seem to bother other people as much as it seems it should. <laughs> okay, good. I, um, NASA talks about life, and they, I think they use Gerald Joyce's, Jerry Joyce's uh, definition of a chemical system capable of Darwinian evolution. Yep. Now, tell me what you think of this, this word Darwinian evolution or a Darwinian threshold that Woes was talk, talk about. Is, is Darwinian capable of 
Darwinian evolution something that's black and white, so now you're not and now you are? Or do you see that as a cascade of selectivity? Or what? tell me your yeah. idea on this. So this is one where I can give you an easier answer than many people will. <laughs> because, and it's not the answer most people use. Um, to me, Darwinian is a great word, and it should be used to refer to a relatively narrow set of processes. And so pan-Darwinism and you know, Darwinian selection of universes is not a direction I would go. The interesting thing is that the direction I would go says that we have a very hard problem that very few people talk about. You can get all kinds of kinetic competition that creates organized states in a disequilibrium system. You can get bulk chemical kinetics. You can get reaction diffusion kinetics. None of that I would call Darwinian. And a lot of it may be relevant to the origin of life and even to processes that maintain life. I would say the place, th there's no reason to extend the word Darwinian into that because we have lots of good words to refer to those already from non-equilibrium statistical mechanics and kinetics. So I would say let Darwinian stand for what it stands for. Darwinian is the competition and selection dynamic that occurs when some form of individuality has emerged so that collections of the individuals can make populations. But that's a loaded language. It sounds like woes a little bit. No, that's, no? let me come back. Okay. I don't read Carl that way. I don't read the Darwinian threshold that way at all. Huh. And I'll, I'm happy to come back because I think it's interesting. And I think Carl's way of thinking about this is enormously important. And I still hew fairly closely to what I think his original intent was, even though there are a lot of people who want to distance from it at this time but I'm, I'll say specifically what I mean. The important thing is, if Darwinian dynamics is predicated on the existence of individuals that form populations, we actually have to explain the emergence of individuality. Mm -hmm. In developmental biology, the emergence and the evolution of forms of individuality is understood as a science problem that is rich and hard. I haven't seen the sophistication of that thought about individuality percolate down into the origin of life community yet. Not with nearly the importance that it seems it should take. Isn't that what people who do membranes, Dave Diemer is about? Uh, not at a very abstract level, yes. They are looking for the emergence of compartmentalization. There are kinds of individuality where compartmentalization is the mechanism. But there's also genomic individuality, and the whole RNA world wants to leap over the problem of the emergence of individuality by saying, let the RNA fragment be a Darwinian individual, yes. in which genotype and phenotype now don't even have a developmental process between right, them, right, right. or a, you know, an ontogenetic process. And you don't like them. that, or that doesn't make sense to you? I think it hopes to assume away a process that's actually going to be a rich interesting, hard domain of science when we get serious about understanding it. How about segre and uh, composons? Compositional inheritance. Yes. Um, that's another mechanism. That's fine. I think individuality is an abstract concept. So we have bioenergetic individuality. We have homeostatic individuality, which are created by various compartments within the cell. We have genomic individuality. But you're using individuality as you know, I'm, I'm a kind of a multi-level selectionist, mm -hmm. and whenever I hear individuality, he's going, oh, he's only talking about one level. No, so, not no, at all. You, so not you're at talking all. about the, the concept of individuality can have multiple levels. Then, in the biosphere we live in, individuality is instantiated over and over at multiple levels. Mm -hmm. In any ecosystem, there will often be many forms of individuality at work at the same time. At the highest and level, level, not level? They will not necessarily be nested. They mm -hmm. can be cross-cutting. Mm -hmm. Every time I get a cold, there's a competition between the viral genomes, genomic individuality, and my own genomes that were willing to stay at home and take care of the cell. Mm -hmm. The fact that viruses can bud out of and reintegrate into free living cellular hosts yeah. says that the genomic notion of individuality is most loosely coupled to the bioenergetic and homeostatic and metabolic notions of individuality that come from the cell. Mm -hmm. <coughs> the fact that genomic individuality comes from RNA or DNA replication, whereas cellular individuality 
comes from just geometry, the fact that you can't make more of one without having a discrete generational event, event in time, mm -hmm. the mechanisms that subserve those different instantiations of individuality are completely different. But the thing that makes an individual different from a homogeneous bulk chemical phase mm. and enables individuals to form parallel copies of the same process in populations so that they can vary, they can persist, and they can be selected upon, that's the sort of thing that exists in the same way as the emergence of a new kind of order parameter exists in statistical physics. It's a well-defined abstraction that can be instantiated in many forms. And to understand both the abstraction and how many forms are relevant to the biosphere, I think that's a rich domain of science. And whether we call it biology or physics, I don't care. It, the goal is to understand the phenomena in their own natural terms and then build whatever language is needed. Well, is there, I mean, a, in physicists, we don't call electrons individuals. No, We don't right. call atoms or that's molecules right. individuals. That's but right. then the biologists start to talk, well, wait a minute, if you get a molecule complicated enough, then we're going to start calling it an individual? Not necessarily, no. No. I'm looking at the here's, the... here's a teaser for you. Um, this is not a koan, but it's a half hour of a harangue <laughs> to explain why every word matters. Uh -huh. So in physics, we've learned a lot about phase transitions as we've learned new classes of phase transitions that introduce new kinds of order parameters. So in elementary particle physics, we understood the phase transitions in which the symmetry groups were Lie groups and the order parameters were subgroups that got frozen out. And then we learned um, things like costerlitz thaulis phase transitions that came from various kinds of pair formation. In glasses, we found phase transitions that didn't exist in a simple way in the symmetry group of the instance, but that had to do with a form of broken ergodicity that could be captured in other places. So we keep understanding new classes of phase transitions by realizing that we need new categories of order parameters to explain what kind of order forms. Here's the koan. The emergence of individuality is the class of phase transitions where the order parameters we need are proper names in Bertrand Russell's sense. What is Bertrand Russell's sense of proper names? The human language sense. Harry, Jane, Frank. All right, now why, that sounds profound. Why is that profound? If I want to understand the emergence of the wave pattern in a belousov jabotinsky reaction, mm. what I need is a Fourier transform. And I need a particular wave number in a particular domain in space that winds up being frozen into the reaction diffusion pattern. If I want to understand a population of bacteria and the fact that they are all parallel copies of something that are similar enough to compete but different enough to carry differentiation and that some of them survive and leave offspring and others don't, what I actually want to know is that Harry has the adaptive variant of something and John doesn't. Mm. And that, you know, Jane has hitchhiking genes where it may be that she has a great copy of this but a bad copy of something, but because they're all bound up in Jane's genome, mm. if horizontal gene transfer is not strong enough and if the good gene is not tested against all possible genomic contexts where it can occur, the bad thing that's unfortunately in the same genome can cause the loss of this thing that might have been terrific had it survived. Mm. All of that is brought into existence when you have the granularity and you have the shared fate that individuality brings in. And that's ultimately what proper names are about because every individual is all of the things that are never reproduced in exactly the same form if that individual is lost, but that can be transmitted if that individual leaves offspring with more or less fidelity and in different combinations. So I think, that I think that proper names as a class of order parameter are a nice way to use informal language to get at what the emergence of individuality means. I, I wrote a chapter a couple of years ago called uh, We Have Not Just Found Extraterrestrials or Have We? And it was based, I was kind of wrote that kind of inspired by Prigozhin's idea of far from equilibrium dissipative system. I said, well, why don't we just call life forms far from equilibrium dissipative systems, and therefore we've already detected stars and galaxies and convection cells elsewhere and hurricanes. We've already found life elsewhere. Right. Uh, what's wrong or right with that idea? Right. So, if you think that the essence of life is an abstract informational pattern and that it's carried out in an arbitrary way on the chemical substrate on a planet, 
then you would be inclined to say, well, you know, the great red spot on Jupiter or hurricanes in the Atlantic each season, eh, same as life. If you don't like that, then you may start to go into the long list of particulars that say, well, life has this and hurricanes don't have it. Life has that and hurricanes don't have it. But then you're in a forest and trees kind of problem. Like, okay, how many characteristics till we call it life? And that's a big mess. I, I, I feel like that's actually a rat hole. Um, I am willing to did, talk. Wait, did you just say the definition of life is a rat hole? Defi no. Trying to define life as a rat hole? I am saying that that particular approach where you start attributing characteristics and you want to draw a dichotomy, mm -hmm. that winds up in a maze. Mm -hmm. And Jack Shostak has, a, in fact, what you are doing with your questions is you're going through the entire sequence of slides in my talk tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, so somehow we're thinking about the problem in similar lines. Shostak has objected strongly to that maze mm -hmm. because he says there are a lot of detailed science problems and imposing a dichotomy on them in an arbitrary way yeah is always going to be an artificial exercise, so don't waste time on it. Well, let, let, I want to be very clear on this. Can you say that in a way that students will understand because, uh, not only students, but I would say 99% of the population of the world believes in this art, artificial dichotomy so strongly that it's hard to get them out of it. And so can you say what you said again in several different ways? I can do it, but we're about to leave the whole thing that was the, my main answer to your yes, last we were. question. That's right. So let's not, okay. let's not lose that, because my answer to your last question is something really strong that I think we can say, okay. and that I don't ever hear anybody else say. Okay, continue then on right? that one, and we'll go back to this. Yeah. And it's the thing that allows you to not go down that branch of forking paths to use, a, or the garden of forking paths to use a Borges analogy or reference. Um, I will say that the difference between the Earth without a biosphere and the difference and the Earth with a biosphere is in the nature of an order parameter. And I'm willing to say what that order parameter is. The order parameter that sets the light, that sets the biosphere apart as a qualitatively new planetary subsystem with a qualitatively new kind of order is that there is a flux of energy and a circulation of matter through a corner of organic chemistry that would not happen on a non-living planet. And it happens in big numbers, gigatons of carbon turned over per year, newly fixed and broken down and returned to the abiotic carbon pool. And it's happening through a particular set of universal core pathways, which are the conserved core metabolic pathways, the close neighbors of different carbon fixation pathways, the anabolic pathways that branch from them. I will argue that the biosphere is the planetary subsystem that supports and in turn is maintained by that flow through that little corner of organic chemistry. Okay. And that's as concrete a thing as saying this diamond is the subset of carbon that has brought this particular crystallographic unit cell into realization in the world. And that's what makes this diamond different from some piece of graphite over there or something that is not carbon and is, doesn't have the unit cell of the diamond. Well, I can guarantee you that there are diamond and graphite elsewhere in the universe, mm -hmm. but can you say the same thing about whether the carbon fixation pathways elsewhere, if they do exist, well, do they exist? That's, that's a more askable question than our generic question earlier. We don't, know how to, we don't have the ability to answer it yet, but there are reasonable tools that with work and some focus would enable us to answer it. And I may live long enough to see that stuff. Okay. No, it's not, it's not a, a vast problem, right? right? What we need to know is we need to know a lot more about the chemical possibility space than yes, we do. Yes, yeah. Computational methods and more disciplined empirical work, particularly in metalloorganics, so soluble metal ligand complexes and minerals, mm. would contribute wonders to that. Big encyclopedias of what happens and where it happens, and the chemical tools to assemble them into systems. Mm. Then we can say, of, okay, that's, that's part one. What's the chemical state space? Part two is, in non-equilibrium settings, 
what kind of flows can be driven through that state space depending on where it's coupled to the different environments. Then we come back to the biosphere and we say, for the properties that contribute to the biosphere's simplicity, the self-amplification, the channeling that are uniquely served by properties of the metabolic pathways we have, now do a full search through the state space, now that you know what it is. How common are they? Are properties at least this favorable to what we've said we think is mm -hmm. important, common, or are they very rare? Mm -hmm. Relative to the places where planetary energetics couple to them, mm -hmm. are you likely to couple always at the same place or to a few places? Now, I'm willing to make a 50 cent bet that the, the pathways in biochemistry are in fact the best things we should be building sensors for on other planetary missions. And the reason I'll say it is the following. The carbon in carbonaceous meteorites doesn't look a lot like biochemistry, but it's not completely unrelated to biochemistry either. There's a significant overlap. At least some of that carbon was formed by mechanisms that are vastly different from the mechanisms that maintain biochemistry on Earth. If you look at the Miller-Urey products with adjusted atmospheres, you can go less reducing. They are not completely unrelated to biochemistry, and yet they're formed from gas phase free radical reactions in many cases. So you have interstellar medium chemistry, which is hard ionization and cold quenching temperatures. Which is everywhere. Which is everywhere, but it's a completely different domain. Your activation mm -hmm. energies are enormous, mm -hmm. and your background quench temperatures are extremely cold. Mm -hmm. So you can maintain particular characters of disequilibrium in the interstellar medium on dust grains and in shock fronts that are nothing like what you, ha what you have in redox chemistry of subsurface water alteration zones. You have planetary atmospheres which have a high activation energy, enough to form free radicals, but not as high as the interstellar medium, and a warmer quench temperature, but not as warm as the subsurface. Mm -hmm. Then you have aqueous phase, which really doesn't like radicals, and single electron transfer that probably almost only happens where metal centers are available to mediate it. You have low activation energies, tenth to a couple of a tenth but let me of, point an, out that, that of an electron volt. Let me, let me say this. Okay, go ahead. And then you have warm quench temperatures, which means things are not stable. Mm. To the extent that you have some commonality of molecules, despite the extreme differences in where complexity tends to form in all of these, mm -hmm. my 50 cent bet is that indicates there are paths of least resistance in organic chemistry. Mm -hmm. And those are the things that are good bets for the skeletons of any carbon complexity. Well, so that's where I was going to go with that. So, so what you just described is what probably a universal description of the beginnings of life everywhere in the universe, not just on Earth. That's the best bet that I could know to make. But we could do much better if we knew more about the state space of chemistry. Okay. All right. Now let's get back to this question of trying to convince 99% of the human population that the question, what is life, is a, what do you call it, a, a labyrinth of forks? No, no, no. No, no. The way people have taken it is Borges's garden of forking paths, but you don't have to take it that way. That was why I gave the, the phase transition definition, because you know you're asking a question the wrong way when it just gets more and more and more complicated and never any clearer. Mm -hmm. And so... My intent was to say, life has a lot of characteristics that you don't see in non-biological systems, and a lot more characteristics, some of which you do see in non-biological systems. Mm -hmm. So if you want to start getting into enumerating characteristics, and then making a choice that's, you know, it's like a game of bingo. If we hit these characteristics and those, then we'll call it live, and if right, we don't, right, right, then right. we're not. That looks like a badly framed question to me. So what you want to say instead is, is there an anchor that pulls everything else to it and that can accrete all of this complexity of characteristics in a non-arbitrary way where they don't accrete in the same pattern unless they're anchored to this? This is what the order parameter is for, the planetary chemistry going through the paths that are not abiotically sampled. But what you're describing here has, not, reminds me more of metabolism rather than information. That is a non-distinction. Okay. As we have from Information Theory 101, mm -hmm. 
And there are a lot of people who will say this is not the only use of the word information. So metabolism has a lot of information in it. It's got tons of embodied information. Right. Like architectural information. Chemistry, like chromosomes. Is, chemistry is the most information-rich system that we know of. That's why physicists are so afraid of it. Okay, well, if that's the case, that's an interesting idea. So, for example, Paul Davies would say, hey, where does the information in, in your DNA come from? I said, of course it comes from the environment. I would say that again and again, he just didn't seem to get it. But the whole point is, if there are information coding systems like RNA or DNA, and then there's information in the environment, yes. then there must be something in between those two. In which, in other words, if so all the information, both. before you had, no, but before you had the RNA, you had the environment. You had an environment full of gradients and all kinds of information there. That had to precede any informational molecule. Yeah. So it had to go from here to here. So what you're saying when you had to say metabolism has information in it, I suppose you're saying that the environment kind of constrains the metabolism and then the metabolism kind of works its way into yeah. the coding molecule. Yeah. There's a sloppy habit of speech that I wish people didn't do. They say information when they're referring to sequence combinatorics. Mm -hmm. Sequence combinatorics is a precise thing. Information is a much bigger precise thing. Mm -hmm. There is, information is always, even in just the Shannon usage, a measure of how restricted an actual distribution is relative to some putative distribution that was your null hypothesis, mm -hmm. right? So the information associated with sequence combinatorics comes from a cognitive model of what the possible sequences are and then wants to reference the observed ensemble of sequences to that cognitive model as a null model. Okay, all to the good. But the thing is, that's looking through a, a hole about that big and saying, my goodness, there's so much of the universe I don't see. Well, yes, of course, because you have to look at the rest of the universe to see it, right? If I look at RNA and DNA, I see the chemistry of cofactor biosynthesis because the synthesis of the purine nucleotides is also the synthesis of folate and flavin and thiamine cofactors. And whereas the base pairing role of nucleic acids only comes into existence once you solve a whole bunch of other problems beside, beyond synthesizing them. All of these other cofactors are useful one molecule at a time. So to look at the base pairing role of the nucleic acids as only a problem in sequence combinatorics and to not recognize the enormous embodied information of the way they're situated in the biosynthetic network that also contains all these cofactors mm -hmm. is to my mind to throw away much of the evidence in the system. Yes, yes, I agree with that. Okay, um, have you ever seen a UFO? Uh, my vision is so bad it's probably constant, <laughs> yes. I mean there's any number of flying things that I can't identify. <laughs> okay, um, let's see, we've covered a lot about what I wanted to ask you. You didn't talk about Darwinian threshold and woes. That's, well, we talked a little bit about that. Let's talk a little bit more about that then. Uh, so uh, your description of, in this discussion, about Darwin, Darwinian selection, what it is, and individuality, reminded me of the Darwinian threshold as I've understood it from reading woes. Right. Now, and then you said, no, no, my opinion is different from that. So yeah, could you? I don't read that that way at all. Okay. When I think about the emergence of individuality, the kind of thing I'm thinking of is closest to Leo Buss's wonderful book, The Evolution of Individuality. So it really is the question, it's like the levels of selection question, but it's much more than that. It's also units of physiology, it's units of development, it's units of everything. That is the set of questions that come into the emergence of individuality. And I happen to like the choice of saying, Darwinian dynamics is predicated on first having a system of individuals and populations that can carry it. Well, what about half individuals? Like an ecosystem, for example, doesn't have a finite boundary and therefore it's not really as individualistic as an a single cell. An ecosystem is not an individual. It is a fundamental evolutionary entity of a different kind. Let's come back to that. Okay. But Darwin, Woese's Darwinian threshold, I read as being completely different. You can have individuals and you can have Darwinian selection for a long time 
But if you have horizontal gene transfer, you don't preserve a record in genome diversity of accidents or historical contingencies. So for woes, the progenote had very well formed in, in my reading of woes. You know, the, the 19, what, 67 book or something, The Origin of the Genetic Code, and then subsequent papers where he repeats some of the same arguments, but I like the book better. I like, I like the clarity of Woese's thinking when it's fully elaborated. Clearly, he's looking at cells that have functioning hereditary systems, they have functioning catalytic systems, and they're subject to selection. But gene transfer in the pre-ribosomal era and into the era of the early functioning ribosome is extensive enough that you don't maintain separate genetic lineages. They get rubbed out relatively quickly. So the thing that for Darwin was the evidence of evolution, which was the comparative analysis of lineages, is not available from that age. Mm -hmm. So for, in my reading of woes, the Darwinian threshold is when you start putting enough barriers to free gene exchange, because the ribosome won't tolerate them, that you first have the emergence of stable lineages and the ability to do historical reconstruction from comparative analysis. But, but that reminds that. But makes, that's not the emergence of individuality. That's the emergence of stable long term lineages. I so it totally sounds like the emergence thing. of sex to me. No, 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 no. Because no. Only, you only get those isolated lineages when you have sex. No. No, no. I mean, bacterial they don't have species, they have strains, right? And therefore, there's all kinds of things that go back and forth. They have plasmids and they have. Or they have lots of horizontal gene transfer. So let's suppose that no, on no, this, no, no, no. But Woese's whole point was that the ribosomal components start to make a resolved tree, and that tree is a pretty good match against a lot of consensus trees for other things that are transferred, and it is more stable than almost any of the other consensus trees. So that has nothing to do with sex. It has nothing to do with the sexually organized forms of genome recombination. It just has to do with, you know, Woese's argument for it in the book on the genetic code, whatever the right year is, was that in an early ribosome that's not reliable, the only proteins, and in gene replication system, in DNA replication systems that are not reliable, as well as translation systems that are not reliable, everything is full of errors. The only proteins you can ever make are those proteins that can get some semblance of phenotype out of being having roughly the right sequence. So these are what he's calling statistical proteins. And the phenotype is somehow spatially correlated with the thing that made it. Yeah, it's whatever, it's whatever function that, pro, it's whatever class of states and associated functions that protein is doing. So a lot of what you can do with precise DNA replication and transcription and translation simply is off the table in the world of statistical proteins. On the other hand, what few statistical protein, what few functions statistical proteins had available to them made them permissive of things like exchange of components of the genetic code and exchange of ribosomal components. So you can do a lot of tweaking of the ribosome in this early era that a more tight protein inventory would not have permitted because if you try to change the genetic code when the proteins are precise, you break everything and it's fatal. However, okay, so Woese argues that that world of innovation sharing in the age of statistical proteins gives you a way of tweaking your ribosome and trying to fit ribosomal peptides and RNAs together in such a way that you get a little bit more reliable coding. But here, and I find this an absolutely beautiful argument, the, the argument, and it, it's a beautiful argument because it also works well with the character of the peptide strands that stretch deepest into the ribosome and that look like they are the most sort of tweaked and non-modular in the way they interact with the RNA. Woe says in this kind of a world by accident, you can tweak and adjust things and get better function, but you're not modular and you're not robust. So, if two strains get better ribosomal translation by adjusting RNA peptide interactions early on, the worst thing that can happen to them is to then exchange those ribosomal peptides or ribosomal RNAs not as a group. Because now what you take in is not only non-functional, 
it folds with and disables the thing you worked so hard to get functioning before. So that's when you put in barriers to gene transfer and you put them in the ribosome from the very beginning. So Woese didn't use the phrasing of Wittgenstein's letter, but I would impute that onto his argument, that the ribosome is a kind of Wittgenstein's letter that needs the statistical proteins to climb up to reliable translation, <coughs> but it's very important to throw innovation sharing away in lineages that have achieved a degree of reasonably reliable translation. And so the very thing that they climbed up on now must be thrown away, and it's throwing away gene transfer that gives you the first emergence of stable ribosomal lineages. And that's Woese's Darwinian and that's threshold. Wo that's Woese's Darwinian threshold. And you don't subscribe to that. No, idea. I think that is beautiful. I think it's outstanding. If, if there were anything much different from that, I would be amazed. And I've never heard any other argument that sounds as sensible. Why can't this, you know, you say throwing away. Why can't this Darwinian threshold be not a threshold, but rather a series of steps in, wh in which your, your barrier is not, hey, now it's in place and now you're, you're dividing them, but, you know, some, a semi-permeable, very permeable, a, a almost not there at all barrier. Well, no, it, the reason it's called a threshold, the threshold is the first thing you step across before which there is nothing. Well, there, you just described a whole bunch of things no, that no, were no, before no, this threshold. No, no, A threshold in general is a thing you cross from one domain into another. Yes. When Woese is talking about the first inhibition of horizontal gene transfer creating the first lineages, mm. it's the firstness of it that makes it a threshold. I, I know, but Other I, stuff is exchanging all over. Yes. That stuff will get inhibited from gene transfer later in different things. So sure, there are a lot of stages of inhibition of gene transfer. Yes. For Woese, <coughs> the Darwinian threshold is the first thing you cross so that before that there were no stable lineages to the distant future that would enable comparative analysis. And after you've crossed the first one, there is at least some stable lineage that will enable comparative analysis. And that's the lineage of the ribosome. But it's not completely stable. It's not completely stable, but it's the difference between nothing and something. <laughs> okay, okay. And that's a big difference, right? Uh, yeah, well, I, I just have in my mind a threat. I have a two domains, and here's the threshold between them. I just go, and I make the threshold larger than either of the domains, and then I wouldn't call it a threshold anymore. I would deconstruct your threshold, or his threshold, possibly into a long series of increasingly uh, impermeable membranes for an increasingly individualistic set of whatever's going on there that we're going to call an individual. I don't, again, you don't like Woese's that? Darwinian threshold is not about individuals. It's about historically this, persistent lineages. Okay, I guess Individuals so. were there all along for a long time uh -huh. when there was no persistent lineage. Oh, so to okay. me, that's why these that's are like two different con conversations okay. entirely. I was confounding right? those two. No. So emergence of individuality needed before you can ever have a Darwinian dynamic of yes. selection and competition. Yes. But that doesn't mean that you have persistent lineages. I see. And so the threshold is to persistent lineages. The threshold, okay. as Woese right. uses the term, is I to see. persistent All lineages. Right. Good. Oh, and oh. so it's people who try to conflate that with the emergence of individuality. Yes. Yes. I don't see how they get that out of a reading of Woese. Okay. Because that's I don't how, see that, that Apparently at all. that's how I did. So I'm going to have to go back and read it again. Yeah. <laughs> okay. um, if we replay the tape of life, do you think anything like human-like intelligence would re-evolve? Don't know. Any um, way of assessing that question? If we replay the tape of life and vinegar is not in it, I will be amazed. Because acetic acid is the most central molecule in the biosphere. Really? I yes. Know. Oh. By so much more in so many different ways that nothing compares to it. What's the chemical formula for acetic acid? CH3COOH. Okay. Not, how about water? Water is more central, isn't it? Water is, you know. <laughs> the air you breathe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, We'll do the thing about the fish. Hey, fellas, how's the water? Um, no. Water is present in all of the planetary systems. It is a component of a great many things. But if you talk about roles and functions and participation, I'm sure acetic acid didn't first come into existence with the emergence of the biosphere. But major roles for acetic acid 
look to me like something that anything that is very common with our biosphere will have gone through that bottleneck and will remain anchored to that compound. So you, in my language, you'd say acetic acid is a convergent feature of evolution. Acetic acid is, no, not a convergent fe feature of evolution. Is -evolution. Acetic acid is part of the organized geochemistry before you ever get any kind okay. of evolution. Okay. I would, my 50 cent bet would be that the special role of the citric acid cycle compounds is not as assured as acetic acid, but anything that looks like our biosphere, I'd be amazed if it didn't go through that gateway too. Mm -hmm. I would bet that the small amino acids, if you have citric acid cycle, I don't see how you would not have the small amino acids, and if you did them, if you did have them, I don't know how you wouldn't use them. Now, I just asked you a question about intelligence, and you're talking about acetic acid. Yeah, we're getting there. <laughs> a lot no, happened. <laughs> a lot okay. happened. Okay. Right? Um, if you go to the complex amino acids, tryptophan, histidine, phenylalanine, would they be the same? Not sure. Um, if you go to the Cambrian radiation and the way gene regulatory networks ramify, now an awful lot is deeply historically contingent. Presumably some form of modeling of the world, which is in its character essentially cognitive, is essential to organization into organisms ever. It gets pretty primitive. I wouldn't call much of that intelligence. Well, let's, let's wipe out all the animals on Earth, and let's say we have fungi and plants. Do you think there would develop some central nervous system that, would, that we would then call cognitive, what uh, you just said? I would say they're already cognitive. I would say that okay. all that is deeply, co deeply cognitive. Plants, fungi, yeah. any multi-cellular yeah. thing. A lot of the essence of cognition, which has to do with making models of the world and then using them as the source of your strategies for going through the world. Mm. Um, all that, that seems to be essential to the kind of autonomy, the quasi-autonomy that life has. Otherwise, it never disconnects from the planetary substrate. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so you, autonomy you, then becomes for, uh, a kind of form of intelligence then? No, no, I think cognition is a collection of mechanisms without which that kind of autonomy is never available to you. Okay. So autonomy is a property realized in a system. Cognition is like a toolbox of mechanisms. And intelligence, does that mean anything? That becomes an interesting question where we want to draw the boundary. Um, you think there's a one-dimensional parameterization between intelligence and cognition and anything No, else? I, I think it's a vast swamp. A swamp, I, a swamp. I, <laughs> I think <laughs> everything's a swamp for you, Eric. <laughs> Life I, I, is a swamp. I believe God. cascading swamp. <laughs> so you know the Taoist painting of the vinegar tasters? No, no. Uh, so there's a Confucianist, there's a Buddhist, and there's a Taoist. But you don't know that. What you see is three men with a finger in the vat of vinegar. Oh. So one sees it as sour, one sees it as bitter, and one sees it as sweet. Oh. So for the Confucianist, it's sour, and the goal of rules is. I'm sure I'm going to get the fine structure of all of this philosophy wrong, but we're in the ballpark. Um, it's the fine structure of rules that hold the distastefulness of life at bay. For the Buddhist, of course, it's bitter and it's the escape from suffering that you need. Mm -hmm. The Taoist says, this is the world. How could I not like it? <laughs> um, so, no, so intelligence is a word that we inherit from the common parlance. And the scientist always has a hard job when we take a word from the loose usage of common mm -hmm. parlance mm -hmm. and say, what does it mean? I think that's always a fool's errand. What we should actually do is say the common word was a big bag with a lot of stuff in it. Mm. Say something precisely and operationally, mm. and then say, okay, is intelligence a reasonable tag to pin on to that? And then that becomes one thing in the bag, but we don't assume it's the only thing. Um, I. When I try to do something similar in my conversations, instead of saying, say something precisely, I say that 
when you're dealing with evolution, everything gets deconstructed as you go further and further into the past, and therefore any definition based on some current structure will be deconstructed. For example, eyeballs. What's an eyeball? You just try to define it. Wait a minute, let's go back 100 million years. Ooh, they're kind of different. Another hundred, it's a proto-eyeball. 100 million years, 300 million years earlier. It's a proto-eyeball. And so it just disappears into the past in that whole stage of evolution from something proto-proto-proto-eyeball that you wouldn't even call an eyeball to it is the interesting thing that we scientists can study. But to try to define an eyeball or, or intelligence or life seems to me a fool's errand. Would you agree with that, or can you modify that to fit your view? This is nice, yeah, good. I think to a statistical physicist, a lot of things that bother other people are not so threatening. Um, if you look at the world in very mechanical terms, you want sharp divisions. You don't like things that are distributions where the tails of one have members that could be called right, mutually exclusive. The others, right? If you're a statistical physicist, you don't mind that so much at all. Because if there's any lesson we were supposed to learn in the 20th century, it's that it's distributions all the way down, and that everything we once thought was a sharp object is actually a distribution. And that has been liberating because we can now talk about distributions well. So for a distribution, I can say how many informative numbers do I need to identify the central tendency such that the rest of the distribution can be modeled as unconditional or as random conditioned on the value of the central tendency. And then I can say, when does a distribution sensibly have two modes as opposed to one? When does the inventory of informative parameters increase? Sometimes that's with respect to a statistical power threshold where I say there's a lot of stuff I'm going to model as power as random because I can't reliably estimate the number of meaningful parameters. And we gain this whole great toolbox of inference. So in that sense, I'm perfectly happy to talk about eyeballs. Because an eyeball, in a statistical mechanics sense, you're saying in the context where it occurs, and with respect to the functions for which you want to say there is selection on it, when has a new mode of preserved structure and function emerged out of the noise of a transition? Mm. And that's a well, that can be a well-posed mm. question. It yeah. certainly is a fair one to go after. Yeah, I, I don't like that because it says, it puts in a threshold and I, my whole thing is getting rid of thresholds and then just make, turning them into gradients that no, are very I, smooth. No, but it's great. This is the whole, this is the thing about phase transitions, right? Well, do you think there was a phase transition that, that you can identify major transitions in the evolution of your eyeball? I think is that what you want to do? much of what is robust in the world is actually correctly captured in the language of phase transitions. And I have a formalism to bring to bear on that, which I didn't have a few years ago. Right. Now, for those of us who don't know much about order, phase transitions and order parameters, order parameters seem to play a central role in your understanding of a lot of things. Yeah. Uh, can you wave your hands a little bit in, in 30 seconds and tell us yeah. what a, uh, an order parameter is? Yeah. First technical language and then less technical language. The order parameter is the set of numbers you need to specify tell where the central tendency of a distribution is toward which all the random stuff is returning. So the way this unpacks, God, it feels like we have the damn air conditioning on in here, <laughs> even though I believe it says heat. So something's not doing what it's supposed to do. There's been no threshold. It's just gotten colder and colder <laughs> since I turned the heater on. <laughs> um, In a system that is disordered with respect to some order-disorder transition. Can you give an example? Of something? Yeah, water and ice. Okay. Gas and solid. So when water freezes into ice, we have a transition, a phase transition. What's the order parameter there? Let me finish the sentence before. Okay. In a system that is disordered in its disordered phase with respect to an order-disorder transition, if I want to know something about a microscopic question in the future. I have to do, and I, my data is in the present. I have to do a hard detailed calculation to get from the present to the future. Because there's no small set of numbers that's gonna give me a good starting estimator of what the future will look like. 
If there is a phase transition and it goes into its ordered phase, then it may take me some time to estimate, but there is a small set of numbers that characterize what makes that ordered phase different from some other possible ordered phase or from no order. And that gives me a good starting estimate for a lot, for a whole infinity of microscopic questions for which I don't have to do a complicated calculation to get that approximation. So, when water is in the liquid, if I want to know the direction of a water molecule, I have to do a detailed molecular dynamic calculation because there's nothing else to know. And that calculation gets harder and less informative as I go further into the picture. The direction? You mean whether it's like this yeah. or this or this? Like how, how the thing is pointed. Okay. If it's frozen into ice, mm -hmm. I have to understand what direction the ice crystal axis is oriented. Mm -hmm. But then once I've gotten a sample estimator from that, mm -hmm. I know about the orientation of an infinite collection of water molecules, or, as or long as they're still some, entrained. Don't, you know, don't we have some, some regions where it's kind of like uh, those regions when you freeze iron or something, you have magnetic field strength? If you have grain boundaries, then you have to deal with that too, I see, I see. right? Do you have grain boundaries in normal like ice cubes in your refrigerator? Yeah, probably. Okay. It probably has a quench to it. Okay. So, yeah. So the whole point of a phase transition is that in, empirically in the world we live in, there are lots of sharp departures where on one side of the departure, there's a certain set of informative parameters that you can know and that give you useful, good, quick approximations to microstates. And then on the other side, the collection of informative parameters is different. It's more or it's less, and it completely changes what you can know. Now, you could say, oh, that's just an ad hoc generalization from a few things in old physics. Mm -hmm. Why should we expect any of that holds in the future? Right, right. But the great thing is that in the world today we can do math. And things that we used to think were just about physics, we realize actually are about the combinatorics and the behavior of large numbers. And so just as the central limit theorem is very general and has lots of variants that occur in spaces with different kinds of structure, we realize that a lot of what we learned as phase transition theory comes from the interaction of the combinatorics of large numbers with the particular structure of the state spaces of the physical systems that we were considering. But the combinatorics of large numbers didn't depend on those state spaces. It was only how they interacted with the structure of the state spaces. Combinatorics of large numbers continues to be what it always has been. So here's, here's a claim. Microscopic states are particular because they have particular sizes. If I want to know about an atom or two or three atoms, I have to tell you how many atoms we're talking about. If I ask, how much does the cat weigh? I don't have to talk about particular atoms. I'm now talking about a macroscopic thing, and I'm not uncertain about whether it's still the same cat based on whether it's inhaled or exhaled a few more molecules. It's very surprising that macroscopic worlds with stable structure emerge in which we don't have to know the exact size to know what the stable structure is. But the process by which macro worlds of indefinite size but definite structure emerge out of micro worlds where the definiteness of the size is very important to the particular structure, that process of emergence is also the process that makes phase transitions important. Because a phase transition occurs in the macro world where we have things of indefinite size but definite structure, and the characterization of that structure undergoes a rearrangement, a kind of avalanche. And so the, th the same thing that makes the structure definite makes the rearrangements of the structure comparatively rare and makes the domains of structure sensibly different. So that's why I'm optimistic that a language of phase transitions with different major modes is going to continue to be a good language to describe the classes of things in the biosphere. Can you map your language of phase transitions onto the language of punctuated equilibrium of Gould and Eldridge? Probably, yes. That's a great question and an insightful question. I think, good. I don't know how far the following statement will generalize, but it was good for the hierarchy of matter. The phase transitions that occur in the hierarchy of matter 
occur in finitary systems. So for instance, a group like rotations in some number of dimensions can freeze out to a different group that is rotations but a fewer number of dimensions. And the thing that matters is the discrete count of the change in the dimensionality. If I ask how doing something like changing a temperature can relate to that change in the representation of a symmetry from one dimension to another, the change of temperature is a continuous thing. The change in a discrete quantity between 3 and 2, or between 8 and 5, or something like that, has measure 0 in any continuum. So as a result, the phase transitions, the rearrangements of structure, have no choice but to have measure 0 relative to the continuous changes of parameters that we use to induce them. So this is why in phase diagrams there are sharp lines that bound continuous regions where the phase is the same. And this is one of the most important insights that comes from the renormalization group, Ken Wilson's um, 1974 physics report and papers associated with it. As you cool a system, it doesn't gradually become a little bit more ordered it remains a liquid all the way until it suddenly is no longer a liquid and is a solid. And that discontinuity, mathematically it's a non-analytic dependence of the order parameter on the tuning parameter. That non-analyticity in large systems is the distinguishing characteristic of phase transitions, <coughs> as Wilson would put it. And what that is reflecting is precisely the fact that structural rearrangements only have a choice to be measure zero in continuum parameter spaces. I have often wondered how much of Gould and Eldridge's punctuated equilibrium comes from the fact that the structural rearrangements can only be finitary and the parameters that lead to them are in some parameter space continuous. What about the, the, the width between a solidus and a liquidus in, a, in the mantle? That's a phase transition that is, has that's a width a, to it. That's a mixed phase. It's a mixed phase. Yeah. And wouldn't that be a good analogy for the major transitions in biology? Couldn't we just have mixed phases? The whole thing is just mixed phase? There could be cases of that. That's, that's fine. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, mixtures occur in cases where you have first order phase transitions, right? Where you have a coexistence region. So, Yes, they are there, but no, they are not the <clears throat> end of rules and discipline. <laughs> they they right. come in very particular context about which we can say precise things. Okay. Are viruses alive? <coughs> are viruses alive? That is a non-meaningful sequence of words. Can you <laughs> it satisfies the rules of English syntax, but that doesn't mean that it means something. Can you make that question more meaningful or some variant of it more meaningful? Yes. If you think, if you are willing to go down the road with me, that says the essence of the living state is defined by participation in the biosphere. Defined by participation by in the biosphere. Participation. What do you mean by participation? I mean. Whether you are part of the biosphere or not has to do with whether your formation and your dynamics and whatever are in some way relevant, positively, negatively, or otherwise, to the preservation of the order that characterizes the biosphere. Living is not a predicate of things. Early in the conversation I said, we don't start with a world of objects and then sort the living and the non-living. If you give me a collection of seals, I can tell you which are the live ones and which are the dead ones. Their alive and dead are good predicates. A predicate is a <coughs> description of a property, right? A description. A predicate is a partitioning of a set into disjoint subsets. Disjoint subsets that yeah. can overlap. No, not if it's a predicate. Uh -huh. Predicate says these are the ones that are in and these are the ones that are out. Oh, black and white. Yeah. Life and death. That's life and not life. That's the nature. No, living and dead is oh. a good predicate. Oh. People have tried to go from our language of living and dead to say, well, given that it's all a world of objects, which are the living ones and which are the non-living ones? Yes. Well, I didn't give anyone that it's a world of objects. The world has a lot more in it than objects. Uh -huh. And the emergence of objects is a hard problem to explain, and it doesn't include everything. So as soon as you don't give a world of objects, you don't have predicates to sort the world of objects. If instead you say, 
the biosphere becomes a sensibly different planetary subsystem when it has an order parameter that's a structural rearrangement of the planet's chemistry. And the essence of the living state is found at the scale of the biosphere, and participation in the biosphere is the relevant measure of your contribution to life. Now, I haven't said anything about objects in that role. Now, in a separate thread of the conversation, we have said the emergence of individuality as an organizational architecture is hugely important to lots of living functions. Bioenergetics, homeostasis, heredity, the Darwinian dynamic, individuality is everywhere and it really matters. Now we can say our virions or our viral life cycles one of the modes of individuality in our biosphere? Well, yes. Who would not readily accept that? Now, since there was no predicate, life is not a predicate, it was never a meaningful concatenation of words to say, is that virion alive? Or is that viral genomic life cycle alive? They participate in the biosphere. So it's not legitimate to say, are you alive? If you want to ask, am I alive or dead, that's a predicate. Okay, are viruses alive or dead? I don't know that that's, I don't know that that partition works for them. It works for you and me and vegetables. But that's because I'm a multicellular thing that dies. Okay, we've got a unicellular thing here, and it divides and divides and divides. We've got a bacteria here. Well, are if, they alive? Ba if bacteria... Is that E. coli alive right there? Well, are, did you mean alive or dead? Uh, well, okay. Okay, did I mean alive or dead? Yes, I did. Okay, then in that case, we I, don't yet have a question. Because if I have an E. coli that, gives, that divides and gives two daughter offspring, okay. then the mother was alive, the daughters, and not dead. Mm -hmm. The daughters are alive and right. not right. dead. Right, but I could take the daughter in any and smash sense, it, and then the other one would still be alive. In any sense that I want to apply to E. coli. If I take one of the daughters and lice it, or if it's accumulating damaged materials and it eventually self-lices or disintegrates, yes then I am willing, I just made a good operational sentence that's concrete. Dead is an informal language from the human world. I'm willing to say yes, that operational thing I will use the tag dead for. Mm -hmm. So that's a dead E. coli, this is a living E. coli. Yes. Okay, that's alive or dead in the informal parlance. That has nothing to do with biotic abiotic, right? I'm not partitioning the E. coli into uh, mm. the world of objects that have the living predicate and the non-living predicate. Uh, so can so I apply It's that a category in? error. Are kind of applied dead and alive to viruses. Is that virus there? I don't see a way to do it. You can do it to E. coli, but not viruses. No, no, no. No, remember what the game is. The game is not to start with the loose language of everyday life and then ask a philosopher what do the words really mean. <laughs> is that right? Is the, that game, <laughs> the game that I'm willing to play is to work hard to say something operational carefully uh -huh. And then when we're in a hurry, we can draw a word from the informal world and use it as a tag. But in the end, we have to have actually been saying something precise to begin with. Okay. So <coughs> for okay. viruses, you know, Patrick Forter says, don't ask questions about the virion and forget that the virus, that there's a whole genomic life cycle. So Forter doesn't like to use the word virus to refer to the virion. He likes to use the word virus to refer to the genomic life cycle of that genome, mm -hmm. and then to use the word virion to refer to the packaged particle. Yes. Because we have both words, why not use them to speak more precisely? Okay. But Forter then wants to assign, he still makes a choice that I think is logically a category error, because he wants to say, <coughs> you wouldn't call the virion alive or dead because there's no sensible way of using the term, but that's just a package. But when we talk about the viral genomic life cycle, I am willing to say it is alive and not dead. I think that's, he gets closer to avoiding the category error, but he could just go one step further and avoid it altogether. I don't think, I think that the viral genomic life cycle is exactly that. It is a form of individuality that is genomic in character and is not tied throughout the whole life cycle to a metabolizing cell. Some of the time it's packaged in a virion, some of the time it's active in a cell. We've now said a completely well-defined thing about the viral genomic life cycle. We don't really, it doesn't matter how we put a tag on it afterward. Are viral genomic life cycles inherent 
to the persistence of the biosphere's patterns? Mm. Apparently, yes. Have they been inherent for a very long time? Probably. Were they responsible for essential transitions like the invention of DNA, as David Prangishvili would hypothesize? Maybe. Now that's a really interesting question. Who wants to get hung up on trying to pin the word alive and dead on a virion when you could ask an interesting question about the role of viral genomic lineages partially free from metabolizing cells as a unique place where DNA might have been innovated and as participants in the biosphere all along. Now we have a completely functioning language and no confusion. How about the confusion between an RNA world and a viral world? What's the difference there? Is there any useful distinction to be made there? I don't, okay, what the RNA world is a handle to refer to depends on who you ask. There is conservative RNA world. If we, hadn't, if we had known more about RNA early on, that term would already have been taken because we still live in an RNA world. Mm -hmm. yes, yes, yes. Um, yes. You made that point in your book, I thought, well. But does that, have, does that answer my question? Uh, my question was, I've heard people describe an RNA world and they say, that sounds like a viral world to me. And what's right and wrong about that observation? Good. I think Eugene Kunin, who knows a lot about viruses, would like to say that there are things about viral functions and life cycles that should inform us about various stages that people refer to as RNA world in the conventional sense. Um, <coughs> my own take would be, I think when we really have a good big picture, we're gonna say viruses are a lot more complicated than that and different in character. Here's a guess. I'm not a virus expert, so I don't think it's a very well-informed guess. The problem of making a cellular envelope is actually a very hard dynamical self-assembly problem because you have to have a lot of components that have to be particularly evolved so that without micromanagement they can assemble into a complicated combination of stress reinforcing rigid materials and also bilayers and transporters and all kinds of stuff. You're talking about the propeat capsids? Or? No, I'm talking about the cell envelope. Mm -hmm. It could turn out that in any cellular system complicated enough to make a functioning cell envelope, it is never free of subsets of components that can self-package and that can give the DNA or RNA partial autonomy from the remaining cellular metabolic processes. So it could turn out that viruses are a lot more like computer viruses than we ever thought, where there could be thresholds of complexity where the debugging problem of making something virus-free <clears throat> is just something you can never get the selection pressure to solve, so they're always there. It could turn out, alternatively, that maintaining some degree of autonomy, you know, so that the men don't always have to stay at home and take care of the household, sometimes they wander around and they live in many different households, it could turn out that there are evolutionary problems that are positively selected for keeping the genome partly autonomous, and that the selection on the cell envelope was actively encouraged <coughs> to maintain these budding forms where the genome can be partly independent. Mm -hmm. It strikes me that all of that is, is on the table right now. So to understand, so I think when we understand viral life cycles and viral packaging, we will understand them in the bigger context of the whole problem of making the very complicated cellular envelope at first of bacteria, principally of bacteria. I don't know how much viral envelopes took on genuinely new concepts in the eukaryotic world. Why would that be specific to the envelope rather than you know, ribosomes and nuclear membranes and just uh, DNA and chromosomes and dividing up the DNA? Because the ribosomal envelope has to do with crystalline packing of proteins of a form that I suspect is more closely associated with what can and can't take part in the cellular envelope assembly problem. Another question. What is your favorite solution to Fermi's paradox? 
saying that most of the terms in it are not nailed down enough to know what they should mean. But don't you have to say they're <coughs> low? They have to be uh, low in order to resolve this paradox, right? There's lots of stars everywhere, and you could, you know, we can almost travel a tenth the speed of light, and it would take us a million years to colonize the galaxy, and yet we don't see the galaxy as being colonized, and therefore, where are they? This is Fermi's paradox. So where are they? And I guess the assumption is that life elsewhere would evolve, it would become intelligent, it would then develop rocket ships and then colonize the galaxy. So is there any particular aspect of that train of logic where you think that's crazy? That, that feels naive. That feels naive. So which yeah. is the most naive part of it? That sound. I have so many bad habits of insulting people. Is, <laughs> it's going to be really important. I do too, but I... I I've, I've no, but it's going to be really important <laughs> that you are generous and protective of me when you edit this. Okay. Because I almost said that's the engineer's eye view. No, that's all right. Um, you can ing insult no, engineers. There are enough of them to defend themselves. Yeah, yeah. I, I really don't... Yeah, I don't... All right, so the engineers are... No. Those. So when people Fermi was an act engineer. as engineers in the world... They know how to solve a small problem, and they imagine that it's a good model for problems that are much bigger and much more complex than the problem they actually are solving mm -hmm. and controlling. When you have a hammer, everything's a nail or something? Well, no, no, no. We as a species are doing a miserable job of fitting into the biosphere that we live in without destroying it without destroying innumerable parts of it. Because we take big actions as engineers with low dimensional solutions. And then we create big perturbations in a system where we don't begin to understand the complexity that is responsible for its existing stasis. And then we imagine that little engineering things that work fine on small scale are going to work on the scale of maintaining a planet long enough to go a long way around in the stellar system? I understand what you just said, but I don't see how it connects to answering the Fermi's problem. People, early hominids, as minimally different from the great apes, seem to be relatively non-destructive in the biosphere. I can see them on the planet for a long time. Low numbers. Low numbers and limited capabilities. Technological people, not clear how long they can survive on the, on the planet as it is. Vonnegut's Galapagos might be a better model in the sense that the technological disruption that we do is so large. A model of people consuming and managing the kinds of energy scales that would involve significant sampling of significant places even on a galaxy scale, much less the cluster or anything like that. Um, All right, let, me, let me interrupt you for a second there because I what I you... I don't think the engineering obviously scales to that level. What you just said reminds me of Arthur, two things. Arthur C. Clarke said, uh, you know, any sufficiently advanced technology is, is, would be indistinguishable from magic. But then there's a German guy, Carl Schroeder, who said, no, no, Arthur, you're wrong. Any sufficiently advanced technology will be indistinguishable from nature. Good. And so I guess the idea is if, if you have an advanced technology that's indistinguishable from nature, it's very hard to detect. I think I want to say something that agrees with the second but is a little bit different from it. They're both wonderful quotes, and I like the rejoinder. I like the correction of Clark and where it's done. The mistake in the engineering view of the world is to say, okay, here's a rocket, here's a man, here's some fuel. And so, all right, let's imagine a man on a rocket with some fuel going a long way. The thing that that lacks is a system view. What I would replace it with is, here's a big parameter space, a galaxy, which is really complicated and mostly empty space. It's hard to see and it's really hard to get into. So for a man in a rocket and some fuel to do anything, that only actually exists if it exists as part of a robust system. So it's a man in a rocket in a society in an economy. Now, it's not a man in a rocket, it's a bunch of people in a lot of rockets with a lot of fuel and a sampling protocol 
in a society and an economy and a biosphere capable of supporting all that. And it's robust for the kinds of timescales relevant to going anywhere. After all, 30,000 years back and forth to the center of the galaxy at acceleration g changes a lot by the time you get back compared to anything we've ever done. We don't have sustainable feeding and violence management in the populations on Earth where everything was provided to our hominid ancestors. The question is how much of an error you make when you focus on the component and you don't ask about the plausibility of a robust system that is the only kind of system that could sustain that component. So the component is a guy on a rocket with some fuel maybe going somewhere. But the question about the robust system is how many people on how many rockets with how much fuel kept alive in a stable social order on a biotically robust planet, how much system level stability is presumed for that guy on a rocket with some fuel to ever arise? So, you know, I can take a single refrigerator and say, wow, what a beautiful work of engineering art. But that refrigerator only works if we're in a stable society with a vast sophistication of technology and of social organization. That hasn't been tested very far. And when I hear people invoke the image of a little piece of technology going somewhere and getting lucky and dis discovering something or reporting something that's just what we were hoping to see, that looks to me like it has zero sophistication or even awareness of systems context in the way it's said. And system stability looks like a thing that's a real problem for us right now. And the fact that it, my, I raise that not as a reprimand that it's a real problem for us, but anytime there's something people really wish they weren't going through and they're going through it anyway, that's a good beginning measure of how much they don't understand about where these multi-component systems and their robustness or fragility come from. Are, so, you, are, are you saying, for example, that uh, self-destruction might be your favorite uh, selection? Uh, solution or just to petering out. Petering, Peter, out. petering out into a situation of turmoil where the stuff that you thought was going to scale so easily, so you have people racing back and forth across the galaxy, that turns out to run aground on things like, oh, Congresses don't allocate money. Right, but it's got to run aground every, everywhere. Yeah, yeah. A lot of things run aground everywhere. <laughs> no, I mean, not everywhere within that particular <coughs> system, but every, on every star system exactly. where you have, okay. Exactly, <laughs> perpetual motion machines don't <laughs> exist anywhere. All right, now if I give you a hundred trillion dollars with the caveat, you have to use this money to try to help answer the question, are we alone, what would you do? What would you spend it on? If you were to give me a hundred million dollars. I'll give you a hundred trillion, a thousand times more. I'll do what Kip Thorne did when they gave him too much money for LIGO. He said, we can't spend that responsibly. We'll put it in the bank. <laughs> um, you would be better using that money for the people it needs to take care of. Uh -huh. No, uh, I can answer that. I can answer a small version of that question in a very urgent way. One of the biggest problems that we have in science right now is that we are not permitted the patience to do work that is useful and not flashy in the short term. And so, There are any number of areas where we need encyclopedias because we can't reason systematically when we don't have full encyclopedias of facts and the machinery to assemble them into models, but models meaning things that enable our minds to backtrack and to take apart problems and to reason our way to places instead of just taking random pot shots in the dark. We have lots of problems involving the state space of chemistry, both states and processes. 
that we need to map out. With 100 million years and a decade, I would ask to not be under you mean pressure. You $100 million? 100, 100, yeah, yeah. Sorry, $100 million <laughs> and a decade. Mm -hmm. I would ask the people who gave that not to ask for publications starting the first year in the glossy magazines. Because the only way they're going to get those kind of publications is for people to do exactly whatever they were doing before. And to not have the freedom to say there's some stuff that just has a long term and we have to be systematic. So if you ask me what are the remarkable differences in origin of life that I use from science today that didn't exist 35 years ago, I would point to a tradition in German microbiology and in some cases in Japanese microbiology that was a tradition of decades of patient work on organisms that didn't make anybody sick, they weren't worth money, and they were not, um, they were not in fashion. But what we have learned about the variation and about the evolution of microbial biochemistry has completely changed what we think the possibilities and the nature of life are. And if there had not been these patient craftsmen workers whose work is absolutely reliable and also thorough, all of that would still be darkness to us. We wouldn't even know it existed. And there are other areas where we need that caliber of work and that degree of professionalism. And it's incredibly hard to form communities and then let them alone from harassment long enough to let that work get done. So I would look for those communities and I would build in those areas. What communities, what areas? Structure of organic and organometallic chemical states and processes is a big one because mm -hmm. we don't know nearly enough about chemistry. You wouldn't produce a space-based interferometer to look at for chemical equilibrium in Earth-like planets that are nearby? That could be good. That's an area where, I mean, the exoplanet people are highly professional and they understand their discipline really well and I don't understand it almost at all. I don't think I have the ability to add anything that would be meaningful to the best of what they already are trying to do. How about uh, invest in high-powered microscopes to look for nano-aliens? Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? I asked this question of an Indian student, and he said he had invested in anti-poverty programs. And he's, I said, "Why do you do that?" And he said, "That's because you have to. If you want to find something, you have to stay alive to find it." Yeah. So he thought that poverty and inequality was the biggest threat to our continuing existence. Therefore, that's the best way to find aliens. There's a lot of wisdom in that. There's a lot of wisdom in that. Um, not least is the wisdom that we have vast human talent that we almost never see. You talk about a shadow biosphere. How about a shadow noosphere? All of the human talent that is stunted because we have societies that never give it an opportunity to survive, much less develop. So you're, with your $100 trillion, you'd take down all the dictatorships and turn them into <laughs> democracies or something? No. Um, <laughs> no, I think the reason the world is a mess is not because most people want it to be a mess. I think the reason it's a mess is that a lot of hard stuff goes on and the people who don't want it to be that way don't know what to do about it. So there's genuinely hard science to be done there. Um, and I don't think that's easy and I don't think it's short. For little tiny problems, just like when you ask about origin of life and you give me a big question, I try to turn it into a little question. Mm -hmm. For the messes that the world is in, in any area where I know a little bit about the problem, <coughs> if you ask me a big question, I'm going to tend to turn it into a little question. Mm. I do the opposite. I turn it into bigger questions if I can think of one. <laughs> you know, this MOOC that I'm trying putting together is called Are We Alone? Well, yeah. how did we get here? Is this an important question? Yeah, good question. Um, Why is it relevant? Some people care about it enormously, and other people say, get the hell out of here. I think this is very tricky. Um, there's a poem, and I forget who the author's name is, but it's called Whitey on the Moon. Waiting? Whitey on the Moon. Whitey on the Moon. Yeah, and it was written in the 1960s. Um, it's not Whitey Ford or something? No, <laughs> no. It's, it's about money going in to satisfy idle curiosities when people are in desperate straits.
it's interesting that you happen to be doing this MOOC at this time because we seem to see democracy in danger of falling apart around the world. And the immediate proximal cause of its falling apart seems to be the unleashing of resentment. So where democracy is falling apart, I don't see it. Let me say this very carefully. It's not wrong of people to say that they're trapped and that their circumstances are not fair or are frustrating. And to blame people whose circumstances are hard on them is not only not productive, it's not, it's not morally good. But at the same time, when people's actions don't build, when the actions are essentially just exercising resentment, you can't give them credit for that because that's not trying to fix something. We live in a world where that is starting to have legs and it could be really dangerous to a lot of us. And so in asking which scientific questions are urgent, we absolutely have to come to grips with the history of increasing frustration, hardship, and maybe lack of alternatives that seem to have unleashed this kind of tidal wave of resentment that we're starting to see washing around the world. So, and we, we may be in tougher times than that because the world is finite and human appetites are not currently accepting that finiteness. So it's not clear whether we're hitting, to some people it's very clear. The question is whether they're as right as they believe they are. One of the open questions whose answer is important and maybe not settled is whether we are hitting the resource constraints of the planet in such a way that the things we have become accustomed to doing cannot be done in the pattern that we've, that we've had in the past. Now, if that's the case, then the whole question of what's scientifically eligible in the future becomes very fraught. Now, there's a good version of that discussion and there's a bad version of that conversation. The bad version of that conversation is the, the version that's done not in good faith, where it's used as a Trojan horse. Because there's a lot of exploitation and there's a lot of stealing in the world. You can say, kill science, kill art, kill music, kill humanities, kill every good thing on the argument that we have to just meet the most basic human need. <coughs> and you can say that in a world where stealing and exploitation still continue to go on rampantly. That's a disingenuous conversation. That's using the good faith of people who accept limits as a way of stealing from them along with everybody else. I don't think that should be tolerated. I think exploitation and profiteering are very good things to get rid of before we get rid of art and science and other things that enable humanity to both see ahead and think better, but maybe also make life more satisfying. Please connect to MOOC. Is this an important question? Does well, that, what you describe Im make it more or less important? No, important in what context? Well, in the context you just described, I Which guess. questions are affordable at what cost and to what end, mm -hmm. right? You could argue that more practical engineering-oriented science is the only thing that can be justified in a resource-limited world. Most small countries that try to maintain scientific enterprises have already made that choice. Mm -hmm. And that's why the only science that they support to a significant degree is applied science. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit further in the tail of the rare event distribution that bigger countries can allow the luxury of somewhat more not immediately applied science. But then there's the question, what's the relation between, um, between exploration expecting there's a payoff and exploration constrained 
by the likelihood of a payoff. That's kind of the intermediate range. I think scientists get themselves in trouble. And we gotta be careful. When pushed on why you do work, just out of curiosity, a lot of scientists kind of go Whitman-esque and they, they rhapsodize about, you know, something about the fulfillment of, curios of curiosity and the apotheosis of being human or whatever. If you are swimming in a world that sees that as a luxury when they lack necessities, you do not make friends in that world by rhapsodizing about curiosity because they threw curiosity away a long time ago. And they will hold against you any indulgence. And if you seem oblivious to the fact that they didn't have the luxury of curiosity and you're asking for public funds to fill curiosity, then that's the beginning of a war. That's not the beginning of a collaborative conversation in a society. So, so this MOOC is a good idea as long as it's low budget. No, I, I don't mean to reduce things to, the, to sound bites in that way. I'm willing to say that in a life without curiosity, I would prefer to die over that. <laughs> and the world is sophisticated enough and technical knowledge is sophisticated enough that that's not a hard choice. And so for me to make the choice that if I can be permitted some amount of curiosity, that's justification for remaining alive. And if I'm incapable of fulfilling it or not allowed anymore, I'm as happy to get off. Okay, that's all right for my choice as long as I don't owe too much to somebody else. But as a society, it's not just your choice and your fulfillment. As a society, we have to say who is served by each action. If curiosity is fulfilling, how many people have enough curiosity that can be fulfilling for them? Is it enough? Sometimes, I mean, a lot of science that we do is still very practical. Galileo was funded because he made better weapons for whoever was funding him, because he understood mechanics better than the people who were on the other side. And that unfortunately is, you know, in the weapon side, unfortunately or otherwise, it's a big part of life. In the engineering side, yes, being able to sit quietly and reason is a way, you know, enables us to see our way to solving problems that you can never solve when you're harassed and in a hurry all the time. Sure. The more of that we can do, the better. I'm all in favor of thinking. And the longer term thinking, the more I am in favor of it. Okay. Let me ask you another question. That is, a lot of what we just talked about, you were using the rational part of your brain. Yeah. But I'd like to ask you a question addressed to your irrational part of your brain, your more emotional part, and that is, what kind of aliens would you like to find? Interesting ones. Interesting ones. It's the same kind of people I would like to find. <laughs> Okay, so ones you can talk to, would you like, some people say, oh, I want to find ones that can solve all my problems, and then they say, well, wait a minute, that would be no good, then I'd be out of a job. No, so, <laughs> no. The world is so much richer than the imagination we have in anticipating it. And so the delight of the world is always the range of things that you would never have thought of, but that once you see them are comprehensible. When you see a movie like uh, Avatar, for example, I think a lot I of young... Did. No, you've never seen Avatar? Okay, they have nine foot tall uh, blue skinned people with, with mildly sexy f females that I think a lot of young men go to see because they want to have sex not, with aliens. Not very imaginative. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm not quite sure. Uh, well, some movies are, some movies aren't. Um, this question, do you think it makes us more, you know, as a biologist, we say, hey, so you have this brain here to keep you alive. and that's, um, do you think that your curiosity, do you think answering these questions will help us keep alive? In other words, is it an adapt, a, a good adaptation if we could figure out, are we alone or not? You know, find them before they find us kind of thing. It's better to be, it's better to discover aliens than to be discovered by aliens. Good. Stephen Hawking says, hey, we should keep our head down because, well, maybe because the age distribution of terrestrial planets is, you know, the average is two billion years older than our Earth. 
And so you put it on a linear scale of technology and then say, oh, they're going to be so much advanced, we're not even, they're just going to kill us or something. Or, anyway, these are some issues that... That, that sounds like a crass framing to me. <laughs> yes. But compared to the following thing, you could say, what is a practical virtue of studying the origin of life? I would argue, especially when you do it in context of all the rest of the sciences, that the origin of life forces you to ask questions about biology and to use the science of biology in ways that we never did in all the questions that we were asking before. And so there were a lot of these false dichotomies, separations of the living world from its planetary context that we've carted along from antiquity into modern biology. And I think the origin of life, the geochemical anchoring of biochemistry, the planetary role of the biosphere as a planetary subsystem, all of these things I think lead to a revision of what we think the living state is in richer and scientifically more valid terms. And we will do better biology as a result. I think in raising our level of systems awareness if we can learn anything from our pure science to guide our engineering, we should make fewer of the same kind of engineering mistakes because we should be more system aware at all turns. And so, yes, there ought to be things that come out of asking about the origin of life that just because they change our habits make science less of a handmaiden to the industrial mentality that moves but doesn't think. So, this is interesting, right? The whole point about the monetary industrial society is that it thrives where it can simplify because the monetary interface is not a rich interface. It's not a multi-dimensional standard of value. There's a single standard of value. So what it does really well is coordinate problems where complicated criteria of value can be reduced to a price and then the price can distribute the problem solving uh, task among many different actors and give each one control over some part of the problem. That's where it really flourishes. It's not surprising that engineering solutions to things like agricultural intervention or you know, some problems of social coordination, they mate well with industry where they oversimplify. But if sustainable participation in the planet can't be done by oversimplifying, then you actually need limitations. You need places where the reduction in the degrees of freedom are inhibited because you say we need a multi-dimensional standard of value that cannot be captured in a price and the part that can be captured in a price is going to oversimplify and is going to lead to big motions on scales that the control system doesn't, does not recommend. As scientists, when we're too optimistic that a little bit of understanding is going to have big solutions, we aid and abet that industrial mentality. If as scientists we can become more careful and more system aware in our thinking, maybe our habits, instead of aiding and abetting the damaging part of the industrial mentality, will instead be to put in a more evolutionary thought toward design, more precautionary principles in the way we do things, so maybe the, the ways in which we participate with paradigms that influence bigger social movements can come out of a better form of science and not be so drawn from the oversimplifying parts of science. And I think in the post-World War II modern era, science has had a lot of good richness and a lot of good complexity in it throughout that time. But I'm not sure the parts of the scientific paradigm that went out into engineering and economy and society were the richest parts of science. I think they were often among the more oversimplified parts of science. Let, let me try to oversimplify this question then. <coughs> the question was, do you think this, this search for our origins and life elsewhere in the universe is something that, I don't know, in the context that you just described of people resenting, I guess, elites or something, um, is, is this something that students should be, is this something that students should be more interested in than they are now? 
or are you becoming more and more interested in it as you study it? I guess everybody becomes more interested in anything when they study it more and more. Yeah. But uh, yeah. I guess is it is an important question. I guess that's 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 the question. Is it an important issue to look into as opposed to I don't know healing cancer, curing, a, making a better chair. I think the answer is ecological. Um, it's a beautiful question. And I think that science often does succeed where it pursues beauty. And I'm not sure what that is. I, I don't think it's that science is pursuing beauty and thus is good. I think it's more like what we experience as beauty is the language in which we report on what is good. Um, there's a lot of stuff that your mind is capable of doing that's richer than your narrative mind is capable of describing or planning. And so a lot of what the mind does that comes from that richer than narrative part, when it succeeds, might be rendered as beauty. <coughs> and so being sensitive to beauty and science might just be using the whole mind to be sensitive to quality in science. How about there's an argument that said that uh, any scientific revolution is be when, we, when science changes who we think we are. So for example, a Copernican Good. revolution or a Good. Darwinian revolution, Freudian Good. revolution. Now, isn't it the case that what trying to find out whether we're alone or not is leading to a revolution in who we are? in the best context of scientific revolutions? In the best outcome, yes. Okay. Best and outcome. Even, even if you don't center it so much on alone, if you center it on, can we get a better understanding of the nature of what life is, what the context for life is, and then what, how we should learn to see ourselves in the context where we most importantly are. So the biosphere as a planetary subsystem. That's, that's less evocative perhaps than are we alone. <coughs> but I think learning to see the biosphere as a planetary subsystem and the emergence of a biosphere as a stage in planetary maturation mm. is a pretty big restructuring of a worldview where biology has been separated from other things before. I think this recognizes an inherent unification that's going to change the character of the sciences and what they can do. You know, when I, when I wake up in the morning, I often uh, forget my dreams. I think our brains are programmed to forget our dreams. And uh, the re reason I'm talking about that is because our, we can, one can ask the question, is this useful knowledge? Some knowledge is, is harmful. So for example, I, I happen to not believe in free will, and yet here I am believing in free will all the time. So I think if I really looked at this really carefully and found out that I, I really was a materialistic reductionist and I did not have any free will, then I would just kind of go crazy, and I have to live in this, this world in which I pretend, mm -hmm. this is a useful belief that I'm important and I have free will, right. and yet it contradicts right. everything I know scientifically. So right. the more, however, the more I find out scientifically about it, the less I have, can subscribe to these otherwise adaptive features. So there's a conflict there. I mean, everything we find out should help us to survive, I guess, and if we find stuff that doesn't, we should maybe not investigate. So there's an argument for why we should not find out about who we are. Respli reply. Hmm. I think the capacity of people's minds to hold contradictions is inexhaustible. <laughs> and so I'm not worried about... Unfortunately or fortunately. Okay. I'm not worried about running out of that capacity anytime <laughs> I soon. I see, okay. Uh, but no, it's a completely, fair, a completely fair question. I have a colleague in game theory who has posited that irrational anger solves problems in game theory that can't be solved with rationality because it's becoming an uncontrollable monster who's not at all worried about self-destruction that provides credible right. threats against all sorts of things. Right, that irrational anger had is an adaptation there for some reason, right? It right. had to evolve, right? Right. So 
there are arguments, there are cogent arguments that there can be forms of power that are unlocked by knowledge that you don't want to have. I don't see obvious candidates for that here. Artificial intelligence? No. Things that Bill Joy is wor worried about? That those are perfectly good, morally aware conversations. I see no complaint that they're happening. Um, they're being conducted well for the context of our time. It strikes me that Peter Singer would not agree with you on the you know killing press a button over here in Nevada and kill somebody over there and it's a concern. It's, a concern. Okay. it's just a machine. But the thing is, it's not like our science has been overly humble in the past. Mm. And if I look at the connectivities in what seems to me good origin of life work today, I see way more opportunities to learn humility than I see to learn hubris. And so... That's a good thing? Yeah. So I wouldn't turn that away. Um, I think a reduction of arrogance is as available to us as an exacerbation of it. And so categorically, I don't see, I don't see huge hazards here. Okay. Another question is, you teach students occasionally. Yeah, and, uh, kind of what a are, small scale. What are the, some of the biggest misconceptions students have about this question, are we alone? We've discussed this a lot of them, but... I've never had a student pursue that with me. You've never had a student pursue misconceptions or... Are, no, are I, I've never had a student worried about the are we alone thing. Okay. Uh, that seems to be a thing that people who write grants love. It, it's tongue-in-cheek that I say people who make MOOCs love. Uh -huh. um, And for, you know, for television shows and all that stuff, people seem to love to bring this out. The scientists that I, that I have worked with, they're much more struck at seeing a parallelism in some little thing in organic chemistry mm -hmm. that suddenly makes logic out of carbon fixation. Mm -hmm. Um, but if they could ask the question, is that carbon fixation something that I should expect on other planets, that's the kind of thing that is more relevant to answering the question, are we alone? Yeah, but it's not clear. That's a perfectly precise question, I think. Yeah, no, no. I, what I was going to say is the are we alone thing doesn't get any emotional traction with me. I, it strikes me as a completely neutral thing. Where what, what question gives you the most, uh, what has the most, uh, as most a, emotional traction with you? Well, as opposed to looking for something on some other planet, that is very motivating. Um, so SETI searches. You've talked to Seth Shostak, for example. Not directly, but I, I'm aware of these things from the culture. How to say, it's experiencing the beauty of reality and realizing that there's a component of it that can fit in your mind and that you can turn over and see. That motivation for me is incredibly compelling. The are we alone leaves me completely indifferent. Really? So you read the movie, did you read, seen the movie Contact? Yeah. And that would left you indifferent, contacting these alien civilizations. It's a flick. It, I can see. Uh, Carl Sagan was in, in, you know, uh, very much oh, involved in this. No, you can see. You can see Carl Sagan's wish to be a storyteller with a certain message in that. You can, unfortunately, you see all the device of writers writing, which is not. You can't fall into a story when you can see all the devices. <laughs> that's that's just a consequence of getting old, right? There are very few things that are still new when so many things are recycled. So you don't tell young people about that, and you hope that they just don't notice it, so that they can en they can enjoy <laughs> Not until them. they get old and jaded. They can enjoy <laughs> them for the first fifteen times before they realize that the sixteenth time is a repetition. <laughs> um, okay. No, but how to say? One of the most 
a, a thing that I can go back to for more times than I can explain was the observation of black hole coalescences. It's not like we didn't know it was going to come. It's not like the general relativity models were not all there available before. But when somebody observes a black hole coalescence and you can listen to a little whoop on the internet, you know, it's like homeopathic science, right? It just comes in over the internet and yet somehow it's moving. And then you can play through the whole history of finding out that space-time is the space-time of general relativity and you can work through the black hole model and you can watch the fabric dynamics and then you can know that that is the universe that we live in. That to me is, it's gripping in a way that's all-consuming. In a way that general relativity wasn't when it made the predictions of the gravitational waves? There's something different about having it locked in and saying there was one and it happened to get here just while I was there standing in the way. So you're emotionally gripped by observations more than theory. No, I am gripped by the whole big edifice of theory that fits the universe into a mind and then the observation that delivers it to immediate experience. Even though there are all these tools mm -hmm. In, that stand in the way of experience. That's okay. Looking through a telescope, you're still seeing. And looking through all of the math, you're still seeing. Um, the aloneness or not aloneness, it, it's like the good science fiction is first good fiction and good science. And something that's just science packaged but junk fiction is not good science fiction. Sure, sure, okay. So stay away from junk versions of Are We Alone, I'm sure, which are much more prevalent than the, the, uh, the one that we're doing here, which is much more science. <laughs> but, I mean, this question of Are We Alone is, it seems like a minefield of philosophical misconceptions that, I, uh, that appeals to me because of that, wait a minute, you think that? Why do you think that? And, well, you have no reason to think that. And so it's filled with lots of misconceptions, some of which we've talked about in this conversation. So that's why I'm attracted to doing it, and, mm -hmm. and I, I'm also attracted to it because it has the potential to change who you know, I think I am or we think we are, and that seems to me something very important role that science can play and has played. Intellectually, I absolutely agree with that, yes. It, it would be the next Copernican revolution to embed life across the biosphere and have the life on Earth merely an instantiation of it and merely acts as if it's a reduction. I don't think being an instantiation of a more general pattern is a reduction at all. Mm -hmm. I think it's wonderful. I'll just say it without the merely and you'd be okay. <laughs> well, yeah, except that it's the, re it's the restructuring of thought. It's for all the people who thought that it was a reification for which it would become merely an instantiation. Mm -hmm. So it depends on which end of the telescope you look through. If you thought that the thing was bigger than the paradigm and therefore the thing was the reification of the paradigm, then only one thing in a wider paradigm diminishes the thing, so it becomes a merely. Mm. On the other hand, if you have more than one instances of something, then the other way to see it is that it suddenly raises the paradigm to a richness that the paradigm never had mm. when all you had of it was one thing. So for instance, any language is great to have, but to have a world full of 6,000 human languages suddenly makes human language interesting in a way that we would never have been capable of making it interesting from only one language. So multiple instantiations of the phenomenon of life make the phenomenon of life rich in a way that we were not capable of making it with one biosphere. So in that sense, yes. Okay. And uh, uh, are we alone? I don't know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't even know what the question means. What in the hell are you talking about? Exactly. No, this is, this is okay. the, the Clint Eastwood, man's got to know his limitations. Okay.